Meredith O'Leary joining us to give an overview of the Northampton-led Regional Public Health Nursing Disease Surveillance Team. And then as we have had at every meeting since we entered a state of emergency, we have an update from Mayor Narkowitz on the city's response. So these leaders have very limited time and have been working long hours for weeks. Um, and some have yet another <laughs> meeting tonight they need to jump to soon. So in the interest of this public service during this time, I'm gonna change the order of the agenda and ask anyone from the public that is here for public comment, <coughs> please wait so that we and the public can get these updates first. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna ask Laura to take the role. We will convene the meeting for these presentations. Once they've concluded, we will recess our participation in the meeting for public comment and then come back into the meeting for the rest of the agenda. So Laura, when you're ready, the role please. Sure, Councillor Dwight. Present. Councillor Foster. Present. Councillor Jarrett. Present. Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Maori. Present. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor Quinlan. Okay. Here. Councillor Shara. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Okay, Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Excellent, thank you. Um, so first of all, welcome to President and CEO of Cooley Dickinson Healthcare, Joanne Marcy, um, and to Jeff Harness, who's also here, the Government Relations Director. Thank you so much for joining us. I know your time is limited and the council is very aware that there may not be a time for additional questions or comments. So I just want to extend a quick thank you from the counselors, including myself, um, who wanted you to know how very grateful we are for the tireless work you and the doctors and the nurses and all staff have been doing for weeks during this crisis um, and for taking the time to update us this evening. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Um, <coughs> great, thanks. Okay, well, thank you and um, good evening. And actually we really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I will take back your thanks and appreciation to all our staff. They definitely know the community appreciates them and it helps to keep reminding them. So I thought I'd start with just kind of an overview and then I do definitely wanna leave uh, time for questions. Um, but first of all, I wanna say we've been working really closely with both Mayor Narkowitz and with Meredith O'Leary and I think, and with other towns. And I think that um, one of the things that has really been proven during this crisis is how people come together in a time of crisis. And I think we're all just trying to help each other. We call each other constantly. Nobody says it's not my job. Nobody says that's not in our purview. We just try to do the right thing. Um, so I thought I'd start with some numbers because I think there's a little bit of a, uh, it helps to understand where we are. And uh, it's amazing how quickly this can move. So if I were here a week ago, I'd probably be telling a very different story. Uh, so uh, this morning we had uh, about a dozen COVID inpatients and that's about what we've had for the last uh, several days. Whereas uh, maybe a week and a half ago, we had as many as 15 to 17. And the projections several weeks ago were significantly higher than that for a surge that would have gone into the you know, 50 to 60 to 70. Um, so we feel like we've plateaued and the projections that we're seeing for us as well as Western Mass is that while I think it will continue, I don't think we're quite at the peak yet, um, certainly we will not see the kinds of volume that we anticipated seeing um, and hopefully we'll start seeing the, the volume go down. Um, now in order to get ready for those huge surges that were predicted, we had uh, worked very hard and quickly to figure out how to create additional capacity. And as I'm sure you all know, in particular, uh, critical care beds are very needed for these patients. So the patients who are in the hospital are, are often quite sick. Um, so we actually are able to uh, triple our capacity compared to our normal volume of the ICU and double our med surge beds. Uh, so that was, a, a really uh, good that we could figure out how to do that and figure out how to staff that. Um, and then we were for a while worrying what would happen when we exceeded that and we are no longer that worried about that. Um, so I think that uh, what this says is that all the social distancing and the hand hygiene and the masks and all the things that we can't wait for them to be over have really been working and I think um, uh, I know one of the questions we were asked is what could the city council do for us? 
And I am um, very worried that as people, particularly in Western Mass, feel like, oh, it's not as bad as we thought, that they will misinterpret that as being an invitation to relax on all of these um, restrictions. And if anything, it's the opposite. And we know from all over the world that you can have second waves of this and that it doesn't take a lot for suddenly to have a, um, a major uh, a new outbreak. So uh, we support everything the mayor and the city has done to really be ahead of the curve in terms of those restrictions and would ask that we continue uh, to do that so that we do not hit those kinds of numbers we originally saw. The other thing in terms of collaboration that's been uh, really heartening is that we've had regular communication with the hospitals from around Western Mass. So we uh, talk at least once a week with the uh, uh, CEOs of uh, Bay State, Mercy, Holyoke, and um, Berkshire, and have had all sorts of plans for how we would uh, use each other if we needed to. So if, for example, the ICU got uh, overwhelmed at Cooley, we, and Mercy had capacity, we would figure out how to move uh, people and equipment and patients. Um, so that's been a really nice collaboration and we will um, continue to do that. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions um, about testing. So uh, testing um, throughout the country was really limited. Uh, there were all sorts of different kinds of resources you needed. So even if you had enough um, swabs, if you didn't have enough what are called viral media to transport the tests or the lab didn't have enough capacity, you had to have that capacity in every stage of the process. So um, it was really frustrating for us and for everybody uh, to have to restrict testing so much in the first few weeks. Um, the good news is we're in a better place. And so as of yesterday, I think it was, we um, expanded the criteria uh, for which people can get tested um, because we now feel like we can test more people a day. We've uh, uh, doubled or tripled our capacity in our drive-through testing, and we also can do some of the testing on sites. So some of the highest priority populations, where knowing the result very quickly, like the homeless, we can turn that around in 45 minutes. Uh, some of the tests still have to go into Boston. Um, so we still have to check with your primary care provider to get referred for testing. And at this point, it is still restricted to those with symptoms, but it's no longer those with symptoms who also are over a certain age or have significant comorbidities. So it is broader than it was. And now everybody who's in the hospital is being tested. All women who are coming in for childbirth are being tested. Um, so we will continue to try to expand uh, and hopefully continue to have more of the supplies we need because I know how desperate people are for that. And we also know it's an important part of the ability to start relaxing perhaps at some point some of the restrictions uh, if we can still identify where there are hot spots. Um, Oh, so if you don't, if you want, if somebody wants to get tested and they don't have a primary care provider, they can just call our call center and we'll make sure you all have that number. And one of the many things that COVID call center was a special call center we set up does is connect people to primary care providers. And we have had patients see their primary care providers, a new patient by video. It's not quite the same, but it's working okay. So um, the other thing I wanted to raise, and I think that you might be able to help us, we're, we're getting concerned um, based on some of our anecdotal data that people are staying away from care for uh, COVID and non-COVID issues. And so we've done such a good job of saying, don't come to the hospital, it's not safe for you, it might not be safe for our staff, stay home, that they are staying home too long and not calling their providers if they're not feeling well, whether it's for respiratory issues or any issues, whether it's appendicitis or something like that. And so we have seen patients who we would have expected typically would have come in a day or two earlier and they came in sicker than they had to. So we're trying to do a real community education um, to say, we're here for you. Don't be embarrassed to call even though you don't have COVID. I have to say, I had a little weird vertigo thing and I can understand it. I felt weird calling. I was like, I know I don't have a pandemic, but I sort of don't feel well and I need to talk to the doctor and they were fine with it. So we have the capacity, we have the video and the telephone set up. So please encourage your constituents to, to use that. And then in terms of their fear, if they do have to come in again, we can do a lot on the phone and video, but we've set up our, uh, our, spaces 
to try as much as possible to sequester those with respiratory illness, so the potential COVID patients from others. So if you come into the emergency department without any respiratory issues, you will be seen in a separate space from those who go to what it's called RED, respiratory ED. Um, and also for the outpatient area, we have a special clinic called RIC, respiratory infection um, uh, clinic, uh, so that people who are going to their primary care doctor for something else can be less concerned about uh, being exposed. And then also all, all patients, visitors, staff are all wearing masks. So I think, although certainly we want people to adhere to the stay home, um, stay home does not include if you need to see a provider because you're sick. So uh, please help us get that message out. Um, I wanna say thank you to a bunch of people. So first of all, uh, as I said to the city, I think has been terrific. Um, the community has been amazing. Um, I mean, we have through the month of April, and I have no doubt it will continue into May, uh, people who are donating food to be delivered to our frontline staff every day, um, and people who have given supplies and PPE and masks and, and just so many different things. And, and just the signs that people put up and what they write has made a tremendous difference to our staff, as I mentioned, and also financially. Um, and we're really grateful for the financial support we've gotten from businesses and from individuals and all the help the radio station gave us. Um, of course, most of all, I want to thank our staff. So I think you probably, you know, recognize how heroic they're being. But um, what's what you may not see is, is how creative they are, and how flexible they are. Um, people figure out a new workflow in an hour. And if it doesn't work well, in the next hour, they figure out another one. And nobody says, no, that's not how we did it for the last seven years. Um, people are being retrained to work in different areas. Sometimes that's you know having to um, uh, learn how to use a different computer system and learn different clinical protocols. Sometimes it's really working um, at something that is not using your skill set. So we have professional staff who where we needed them was to go to the laundry room and help to uh, uh, you know, distribute the amazing amounts of, of uh, gowns that we have to get out every day. And people are doing it and nobody is complaining. Um, so that's really, really wonderful. Um, and then, you know, so what, what are we doing for staff? Um, because we certainly appreciate everything they're doing. So first and foremost is trying to keep them safe. So that includes all the supplies and equipment and PPE we have them. I think we were um, pretty early on in adopting a lot of the restrictions in terms of visitors coming in, in terms of patients, other patients having to wear masks. Um, lots of infection control policies that uh, we have a terrific uh, Department of Infection Prevention. And then we also obviously rely on partners in Mass General. So we have all the, the latest information. Um, we have reassigned, as I said, many staff if their area was not busy, given that we obviously have ramped down on all the elective procedures and out outpatient services. <clears throat> so we reassigned staff. Many staff are working remotely if they can. And for those for whom there isn't really an appropriate reassignment or they can't work remotely, we have a wage security program. So people at this point know that they can have up to eight weeks of full pay. Um, not having to dip into their normal leave or any or sick leave or any of that, <clears throat> just to make sure that they um, don't worry about that, don't feel like they're getting penalized financially. And then obviously for the staff, like all of us, there's a lot of emotional um, and mental stress. And so we have 24 seven employee assistance program and are trying to send out lots of materials and lots of resources to support them uh, support them talking to their families. Actually, staff can stay at a hotel um, on an intermittent basis if they just feel like it's too long a day, too hard to go home and try to smile with their kids, uh, or they just don't want to see their husband right now or their partner. Um, and some people have taken advantage of that and we pay for that. Um, so I mentioned the call center and uh, we'll make sure to get that information to you if you don't have it, because people can call, as I said, for a primary care provider but also to get information on testing, uh, information on um, how to, if they wanna donate something, how to help, whatever questions they have. We have a, both clinical and non-clinical staff there to help. Um, so I wanna talk about sort of a difficult topic is the financial impact of this. And obviously uh, Cooley is not the only one significantly impacted and we totally recognize that. Um, but the, the impact on Cooley, um, like all hospitals, is really um, staggering. 
Um, we have obviously tons of expenses we wouldn't usually have, uh, whether it's training all these staff or uh, the extra PPE, the extra equipment, the extra supplies, buying vents, renting vents so that we'd have enough vents. All of that is significant. And then even larger is the um, revenue we won't get because of choosing to uh, of following the recommendation from the governor, but even doing it earlier to stop um, uh, the elective procedures and all sorts of outpatient. Um, the federal and state help that we've gotten, while you know, I think you probably all understand this, but the general public often sees those numbers and they sound really huge when you spread it over the nation. But the reality is, for example, the help we got from the federal, um, the CARES money we got, um, makes up for about 10 days of our losses. Um, so, you know, that, that's a drop in the bucket and um, we're gonna all need to advocate strongly for lots of places that need dollars and hospitals is certainly one of them. Uh, again, we're proud in despite these financial troubles of the fact that we've done the wage security and we've been able to do no pay cuts or furloughs um, at this point. Um, so what I wanted to end on is really asking for whatever you can do to make sure that we keep up the social distancing, um, the hand washing. We could move backwards so quickly. We love to start planning for how we might, you know, how and when we'll reopen. And we need to see a really sustained um, reduction in cases in the hospital. I don't, we won't see a reduction in cases because as we expand testing, we'll obviously be doing a lot more uh, case finding. So with that, oh, good, I took 10 minutes as I predicted. Um, I and uh, Jeff, who's been working tirelessly around a lot of our community health work and community health support, are happy to answer any questions. Oh, thank you. That's so generous of you to take that extra time. Um, Council of the Barge, I see that your hand is up. Would, do you have... No, she muted you. She's unmuted. Do you have a question, Councilor LaBarge? Yes, I think I sent my question to you the other day. They were given to Joanne, yes. Yes, and that was in regards to my concern is somebody coming in who has a disability, say that person is deaf, how do you go about taking care of them? And also, how do you somehow get an interpreter to come in for them when there's restrictions in the hospital for people coming in. So the good news is that like for this meeting, technology is an amazing thing. So we actually have uh, um, remote interpreters um, that uh, we can bring to any patient, uh, including interpreters for the deaf. Um, you know, for some patients, is that as easy as doing it on in real, um, you know, in real life? Um, but in general, it seems to work well. Jeff, I know you've kind of watched that and worked with Emma on that. We've also translated a lot of materials, uh, particularly the communication out about social distancing and, and what to do if you want to be tested. Jeff, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I would add, uh, first of all, I think the technology is amazing. The staff can wheel in a, a video and uh, our own staff can do the interpretation for Spanish but they also will arrange for interpretation in other languages or including American Sign Language. And also we have been in touch with um, Stavros um, staff to, uh, to try to be as on top as we possibly can be to make sure that people with disabilities are getting the level of service that they need, including um, support from their regular personal care attendants. We also do, you know, I think you all know we have this pretty restricted visitor policy, which is basically almost no visitors allowed for inpatients, but we do have um, some exceptions. One is for um, somebody who is going through childbirth, they're allowed to have one person with them. And then visitor uh, patients, inpatients who for any reason cannot um, appropriately articulate their needs to their staff and the providers or can't understand it, then they would be able to have someone there to help as well. Um, so we, we hope we're identifying the people who need that and making those exceptions. Thank you, Joanne. You're welcome, Mary. Uh, counselors, other questions? I, oh, Counselor Mayori. Uh, Oops. <laughs> Unmute yourself. 
There yeah. you go. Yeah, I would. I just wanted to briefly, uh, you know, go um, hear from you and have you confirm the the importance of the, the new the face covering um, order that has come out. Um, uh, I I do like how in the press release um, it was emphasized that this isn't really an opportunity for people to become vigilantes about it. But um, if you could just just speak briefly to this new order, um, I know some people have concerns. Well, I think as I, you know, as I um, noted that we are very supportive of pretty much anything that can be done to reduce the spread. You know, it's interesting because again, things move so quickly in this crisis. Um, I think it was only two weeks ago, Jeff, that we were talking to the Amherst um, town meeting. Um, and uh, they were asking me, that was before that the feds came out with a recommendation about masks. So they're asking me about it. I said, well, I, I, you know, I think it could be good, but if it at all gives people a false sense of security and they wear you know, a bandana and think then it's okay to you know, sort of be you know, six inches away from people they don't know. So I think as long as we continue to be very clear that these are um, not instead of the other uh, important restrictions that you can't stop washing your hands, you can't stop uh, being careful and staying away from people at the grocery store. Um, I think it seems like it's helping and the literature says that it is helpful for protecting um, your people who you run into to be wearing those masks. I'd like to add a, a few comments about the mask, which is that Cooley Dickinson is um, accepting masks. We're able to wash them and package them. And, um, and then turn them over to Meredith O'Leary for distribution. And um, based on the list I saw this afternoon, there's greater need than we currently have supplies. So anyone out there who is good at sewing and has a little time on their hands, um, we would love to get more so that we can do more distribution. And um, let me take also this opportunity to put out the number for our call center. And by the way, the call center is open Monday through Friday, 8 to 6.30. Also Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 5. Uh, you can access that through our website, cooleydickinson.org, or you can call 1-888-554-4234. That's certainly um, not Thank only you. for dimensions, but also for people who are looking for information, who may, uh, may be experiencing mental health concerns or or need food or other basic supports, uh, they can call that number and get pointed in the right direction. Thank you, Rachel. Rachel. He's always ready with the visual aid. Thank you. Um, also, just to remind people, and again, I feel like it's been really clear in all the... Oh. Joanne, you're frozen for a second. Mm. Joanne, if you can hear me, we can't hear you. Well, while Joanne is getting unfrozen, I will also add a different point, which is that um, some of our doctors and other staff have been in touch with Northampton Housing Authority staff, uh, local skilled nursing facilities, assisted living, and other congregate living situations to, to offer some recommendations for um, hygiene, uh, policies, protocols, to uh, keep people in those uh, communal living situations as safe as possible. Thank you. Um, we may have lost Joanne. I'll be on the lookout for her. Um, Councillor Quinlan, your hand is up. Um, I don't know if you have a question that maybe Jeff could answer. She's coming back in. I, th I think Jeff would be able to answer it. Um, and it was just a question about uh, thank you very much, by the way, Jeff and, and Joanne, who's who's suddenly not here now, but uh, I appreciate your time tonight, and I know you're under pressure for time, but uh, I was curious about your access to PPE. I mean, we've read some stories uh, in various news publications about uh, hospitals having trouble accessing, um, you know, health, P you know, medical PPE, and I'm wondering what your supply chain is like, and if it's, if you feel confident that you'll be able to stay in stock on what you need. So early on in this crisis, um, access to PPE was a pretty significant problem for everybody. And um, that, is, that problem has gotten better and better over time. And uh, this is uh, an example of being part of Partners of uh, Partners Healthcare has been extremely helpful to us. They've been able to uh, keep us supplied with masks 
I believe I heard most recently that gowns were a little bit of a challenge. So uh, depending on the day, the, the exact PPE we need uh, sometimes uh, is better and sometimes not as good. But generally the trend has been better and better. And um, at the moment we do have what we need. Now that's Thanks, also, Thank you. am I back on? Can you yes, you are, you are. Yes. Um, so, you know, that's both um, a reflection of the fact that the supply chain has gotten better in general, um, but also of the lower numbers we've had. So we haven't had to use as much, um, but um, also the, the new um, site in Boston where you can have N95s, which is kind of the, the the masks that we use when we're actually working with COVID patients, um, that those can now be decontaminated um, is really helpful as well. Because when we were always looking ahead, it was hard to imagine we would have enough N95s. And then, as I said, the testing supplies were a real issue, but right now we have sort of enough for the next couple of weeks and some sense that as long as the supply chain keeps moving. But at any point, if there was a break in the supply chain, if president decided he was going to take some from Massachusetts, for example, um, that would that would quickly turn into a problem because we don't have months of supplies on hand. Hmm. Sure. Thank you. Um, uh, also, I should quickly say, I should thank actually Councillor Quinlan, who um, really helped uh, facilitate getting both of you on tonight. So thank you to Councillor Quinlan. I was remiss in not uh, thanking you earlier for, for your help in in this. Um, counselors, any other questions before we let, let these two people go to their next meeting? I wish it was to dinner or bed, but alas, it's not. Anything? Okay. I don't see any other questions. Again, thank you both from the bottom of our hearts. Um, we're so very, very grateful. I hope you do get to go to bed sometime early tonight. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and thank you for telling us how we can help you. Um, but please keep in touch. If there are other ways, never hesitate to reach out um, and tell us what, you know, in what ways that we can be helpful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so uh, next um, I'm gonna have uh, Mayor Narkowitz and Director O'Leary come on. Um, and Mayor Narkowitz, it's up to you. You know, I don't know who you would like to have go go first, um, but also we want to thank you both for um, for being here tonight. We know that uh, in addition to you know Meredith, in addition to the around the clock work that you've now been doing for weeks, you were um, you were watching and planning and preparing for even weeks before it sort of became more of a recognized crisis. So. Um, we offer you great thanks and we're very um, glad that you could spend some time with us tonight. So, um, Mayor Narkowitz. So, um, I, uh, Meredith has been going since the early morning and just finished a Board of Health meeting. So, um, I will follow my custom on, uh, on our daily emergency calls and have Meredith go first. Um, so let her let her go first, and then I'll follow up so she can uh, get home and and uh, get some dinner and and get some rest for what I'm sure will be another long day. Okay, absolutely. So Meredith, you are unmuted. Hello, counselors. Thank you for inviting me tonight. Um, I'm not really sure what it is that you want to hear from me. I didn't look at your agenda. I apologize. Today has been a very long day, um, full of surprises, but we've managed to get through. I'll just kind of update you on some of the big projects that I've been working on up to date, and then I'll open it up to questions for you. If you have anything for me that you'd like me to answer, um, we can just move forward that way. I do know um, through a email or a phone call that Councillor Labarge was very interested in hearing about the Public Health Nursing Collaborative that we started. So to give you some background on that, the City of Northampton Health Department um, has been the fiduciary agent for the Regional Public Health Preparedness Coalition since I uh, came to Northampton nine years ago. And what that means is the majority of Hampshire County communities, plus a few little outliers in um, Franklin and Hamden County, are part of this emergency preparedness coalition, and we have monthly meetings to prepare to prepare for such um, an event like this. We never imagined we'd see it in our days, but we have been actually planning for a pandemic. 
So fast forward um, to today or a month ago, um, one of the responsibilities of the public health departments is to do contract tracing, uh, contact identification, interviewing on confirmed and suspected cases of COVID, um, in interviews of quarantined individuals, and any other information that's necessary that we need to provide to MDPH and um, put into a surveillance system, which we call MAVEN. This is a huge undertaking for a city um, of even Northampton with one public health nurse with the amount of cases that we're getting, who has the infrastructure to actually do the work, never mind those communities that have a board of health, but that don't have a health department. So early on when we started seeing cases, when we do our contact investigation, we have to communicate or assign cases to other communities that might have someone who um, was in contact with someone who was COVID positive or presumed COVID positive. And again, with all of these smaller communities only having a board of health that might have um, an email that they check once a week or a board of health meeting that they get to once a month, trying to do these investigations was very challenging and they just couldn't be done, but yet we knew the importance of this. So quickly, I mobilized to um, do a needs assessment of our um, Emergency Preparedness Coalition to see if they um, would be willing to join this collaborative where we could do, the city of Northampton could hire and train a bunch of public health nurses to do all of this MAVEN work, this contact investigation and interviewing and so on and so forth for them. Would they be willing to participate? When I put out this needs assessment, I knew that there was this round um, of money coming down from DPH that was gonna go right to local boards of health. And I figured if I took a percentage of, or if they gave us a percentage of that money based on population, that we could support a program of such. So long story short, many of our communities jumped on this. We have 11 communities right now participating in this collaborative, and we are actually investigating currently 160 cases. These are just positive COVID cases that we're investigating. And for every positive COVID case, we may have anywhere from two to 22 or even more um, uh, people that might have to be actually investigated or have an interview with to put in quarantine. So that this very big flow chart that we work down to make sure that we're getting all the right information and that everybody is doing the right things that they need to be doing at that time. So um, like I said, 11 communities, we have eight fully trained nurses and my full-time public health nurse, Jennifer Meyer, is acting as the supervisor for the nurses that we contracted with. For each community that signed on to this program, we have an MOU with this community and it's for eight weeks. And then every eight weeks, because that's what the funding um, is, how much how the funding is supposed to go for an eight week program, whatever you wanna use it for, PPE, nursing, whatever your needs are. So every eight weeks, we will reevaluate whether or not the said community wants to continue with this collaborative. Does anyone have questions about that? I can't hear you, Jean. That's because okay. I muted myself, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Councillor Labarge actually has a question. Thank you, Councillor. Um, thank you, Meredith, for being here. And um, I was doing a little research today mm -hmm. in regards about um, the latest data. And they are saying that the testing itself is, it's going to take a lot of time to do this. And what I had read, it said, according to the latest data I have read as of today, even in the United States, is nowhere near being able to test or trace at the scale necessary to transition out of lockdown. They are saying Americans have yet to accept the idea that isolation will continue to be part of everyday life. And we just heard that from Joanne too. 
-hmm. about isolation, about washing your hands, mm -hmm. you know, wearing your mask and so forth like that. And I agree with all that. My question is, we're talking about, which I support, believe me, of what you're going to be doing here with eight nurses within an eight-week program, going back again to get another grant for it. How long, you know, you're saying you have 150 patients that you're going to be going ahead and go forward, try to trace, like, who they've been near and so forth. Is that hearing? Yep, that's correct, Council of Ours. Mm -hmm. Contract tracing is extremely important. I mean, tests have been limited, right? You know, at the beginning of this three to four weeks ago, we were only seeing about 15 tests a day coming out of Cooley Dickinson Hospital. No fault of their own. That's just what the state allowed. Um, we were only seeing, you know, in the beginning of this, 500 tests being allowed in all of Massachusetts, you know, in the earliest days. Now, Massachusetts on average is seeing almost 6,000 tests a day. We have almost 30 laboratories on board. Um, so we are ramping it up. It is, testing is the most important component on how we move forward. We need to know who out there has it and who their direct contacts are in order, before we make any decisions on how to open back up. We need, right now these numbers that are out there are extremely arbitrary. They mean nothing. There's no context to them. When I say to you, I don't know if you've um, heard me or read in the paper, I haven't been releasing town level or city level data at all for many of reasons. One of them being HIPAA and privacy reasons. Two, because without context behind the number, it's meaningless. You know, um, today we have 70 cases. A couple weeks ago, we didn't. Um, but that's not the true story about how many cases there are of Northampton residents that, that are ill. Mm -hmm. So we absolutely by far need more widespread testing to happen in the state of Massachusetts before we make any decisions on how to open back up. The only people that are being tested right now are healthcare workers, first responders, essential, now they opened it up to grocery store workers. Um, the, it's, the parameters are still very strict. People who live in congregate living, we need to get it to a place where anybody who is feeling sick or perhaps actually had contact with someone who was COVID positive can get tested before these decisions are made. So you bring up a very good point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meredith. And thank you for all the hard work that you've been doing in your department. Thank you. Thank you. Counselors, other questions? Uh, Counselor Jarrett. Uh, hi, Meredith. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I uh, was wondering if you're getting support from the Community Tracing Collaborative, the state level. Um, there was a report that they were hiring a thousand people to do contact tracing and uh, just if you could speak to that. Sure. So um, I'm not sure what kind of support we're going to get at this point. They're really focusing on the communities that don't have any public health nursing support, the infrastructure to do the work. So those are the priority communities. And then supposedly they're supposed to open it up to all the communities by May 1st. Um, I'm, I hate to say I'm a little leery about the program. I don't know enough about it to to say I'm leery or not leery of it. What I can say to you about our program is that these are accredited licensed RNs that work under my direction, under the supervision of uh, another public health nurse who has been doing this with me for five years. So I know exactly the type of care and questions that are being asked to our patients and to our residents. And you know, with the, with the contract tracing program, these are more of, um, uh, I feel like it's more of a hotline center that people are just giving scripts. So I want to learn more about that before I make a decision whether or not they'll be able to support the work that we're doing. I'm not sure if I'm even going to have a choice. It might just be governor's orders that they do the work and just take the relief off the health departments. But uh, tomorrow we have a DPH call where I'll learn more about that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nash. 
Yes, hello. Hey, Meredith, I'd like to um, just say thank you for all the, the terrific work you've been doing. Um, I feel like when I get information you, from you, I'm getting information that's about a week ahead of what is going to come out in, um, you know, or several weeks ahead of what's coming out of the White House. But you've really done a terrific job of keeping us informed and on the cutting edge. And um, just want to thank you for your work. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Councillor Nash. Other councillors. Okay. Meredith, I don't see any other questions for you. So I, if um, you like any information on anything else of the pro the shelters or the orders that we've passed, I'm open. I, I know it's been a long day for me, as I'm sure for all of you, but I'm here for you now. So if you have any questions about anything that we're doing, I'm more than happy to answer those. Oh, well, thank you for that offer. I actually would very much like to hear about the shelter, if you could update us a little bit oh, on that. Certainly. Okay, certainly. So um, we have a shelter for our homeless, those who identify um, with the streets of Northampton as their residence. And it's a 24 hour, seven day a week shelter at the Northampton High School. Um, it's staffed by ServiceNet staff, volunteers, and we have a security um, person, PD, all, at all times. So we've broken it up into three shifts from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., 3.30 p.m. to 11 p.m., and then 10.30 p.m. to 8.30 a.m. So for every shift, we have three ServiceNet residents, excuse me, staff, two volunteers, and one security. Also at the shelter, we have recovery coaches for two two-hour blocks a day. We have MAT providers. We have Tapestry Health that brings their mobile unit there every single morning. We have NA meetings, AA meetings. We have prescription delivery services, and we have telehealth um, there. We have food that's delivered three times a day. It's delivered by our fire department, and the food comes from an assortment. Um, the jail provides breakfast. Smith College usually provides lunch and dinner. We have donations that have been made from community residents. McDonald's offers a meal once a week. Um, Steve Connors from Veterans Affair did uh, Easter brunch last week, and he's going to do a pancake breakfast this Sunday. CVS donated candy for Easter. So um, it's really kind of heartwarming, all of the donations that we've been getting. Um, the city provides transportation Monday through Friday from the shelter down to the resource centers um, at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., and 12 p.m. so people can do their, their laundry. Um, the shelter itself is it's very prescribed. We have expectations of our residents, and they have to meet expectations or they're asked to leave. These decisions are extremely hard for me to make, um, but I have to do what's in the best interest of all of the community that's there. Um, and I, unfortunately, I've had to make that a, a couple of times. Um, when you go to the um, high school, the first thing you see are two giant hand wash stations that were donated by United Way, and they're equipped with soap and paper towels, so you wash your hands there. You open the front doors to walk into where you, um, where, you, where, you, where you have to sign in, and before you sign in, you have to, there's a big sign that says you must sanitize, so everybody sanitizes. Then you sign in or check in that you're here. If it's the first time that you're entering the shelter or if you've left campus and you come back, you have to get a full screening. So we take your temperature and we ask you a litmus of questions about your health for today and 24 hours prior to today. If you screen that you're okay, you're allowed into the shelter. Um, if you screen that you're not feeling well, that you might have COVID-like symptoms, we put you somewhere else. But let me walk you through the rest of it. So if you're allowed to go into the shelter, we have the gymnasium set up for 56 cops. We started, when we first opened up, we started with 36 residents and we opened up, uh, ooh, April 1st was our first day. And today we're at, we're full. We run anywhere between 50 and 55 residents any single night. We have three residents that are in our quarantine shelter. Our quarantine shelter used to be the quarantine and isolation shelter, but I'll get to that in a minute. It's where if you screen that either you've traveled outside of Massachusetts and, or you're, you are, have come in contact with someone who is COVID positive, we need to take you out of 
the, the Northampton High School shelter because we want that to remain a healthy shelter and put you somewhere else where you cannot possibly transmit um, the disease to someone. So our quarantine shelter right now is over in Hatfield and then our isolation shelter was just recently taken over um, recently as of yesterday at some point by MEMA, which is going to be the quality in. So if you screen that you're sick, we get you tested at Cooley Dickinson Hospital and then you go to the quality end over, um, I believe it's Con Street, can't remember. But if you screened in that you were in contact with someone who was sick or you just traveled out from outside of the state, we have to put you in quarantine. So we have all of those set up and we have the same types of services there for you, which I just talked about. The doors close at 9.30 p.m. sharp. You're not allowed into the shelter after that. If you don't come back to the shelter that night, you do lose your, your space, unfortunately. This is a dry shelter. We don't have any tolerance for drug or alcohol use. Um, if someone comes in, we do check backpacks and um, if they happen to have something on them, the security guard or the police department at that time does confiscate it. There are lockers that are provided to every shelter resident to lock up their belongings and any type of medication that they might have. The shelter has been open for two weeks now, and I have to tell you, the residents there are extremely, for the most part, extremely respectful and extremely appreciative of the services that they are, that we're providing them. Um, the shelter looks and smells like the first day that I opened it up, and I have to commend the, you know, our emergency management team and the volunteers and service net for helping to get this operation mobilized. We've been talking about opening a shelter. We were talking for probably three weeks prior to getting it opened. How are we going to do this? And I know there are still communities, you know, four weeks, five weeks after the fact that we started these conversations that are still having the conversation and haven't mobilized it. We just, we did it. Um, Mima thanked us, thanked us last Saturday. They just said, you guys are a just do it type of community. And I'm, I'm thankful to my EMT team for that and the support and the mayor's support and this in this initiative. Thank you so much for that, um, for that update and for that, that information and that work. Um, uh, counselors, are there other things, we have this amazing opportunity to have Meredith here with us. Are there other things that you'd like to ask her? Counselor Nash. Yes, uh, Meredith, what are ways that people can help uh, specifically with the shelter um, in terms of, uh, you know, volunteering or providing uh, funds to help out? Uh, what can they do around that? Certainly. So we do have a shelter coordinator and her name is Lauren Davin and I'd be, I, I'd like to share her contact information with you. Um, people can sign up to be a medical reserve corps volunteer and going through this system, we have the Corey checks done. We have, if you're a licensed um, you know, medical provider, or whatever your license may be, those are vetted and checked and you're all set ready to go. It's a lot easier going through this process than just having just in time um, volunteers showing up ready to help. Um, so having um, volunteers would be number one, spreading that word and how to become a volunteer is fantastic. We have enough volunteers right now to get us through the next month per se, but there is um, we, we have a worksheet that if you are, have been okay, screened to be okay to become a volunteer, that you can sign up for whatever shifts that you want. I do believe that um, the mayor has set up a fund to donate to, and he could provide you with that information because the city is absorbing a lot of the cost to run this shelter. Um, we will get some money back from MEMA, but I do believe that there's a fund that you can, you can volunteer to. Um, the We've put out a call to action in the past for um, toiletry items. We're still in need of those, um, you know, toothbrush, toothpaste, towels, um, women's health products. Um, there's a lot of items that can be donated. Sanitizer is a big item that we're looking for and Clorox wipes. We provide each shelter resident with um, a goodie bag full of health and, you know, the health and beauty products and sanitizer wipes so they can take care of their own space. Um, and then if somebody has a special or unique type of service that they could provide, um, counseling, um, 
uh, SUD support of any type, feel free to reach out to me. Um, there's a lot that we could do to enhance what we're doing. Thank you. Um, Councillor Foster. Hi, Meredith, um, thank you so much for taking the time to be here and for this update and for your tremendous work. I just wanna echo that. And I get some questions from constituents regarding some of the, the decisions that are made. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity um, to sort of explain uh, some of the decisions that are made, made um, to help enforce social distancing um, regarding closing some of the parks um, and some of those decisions you're making and, and kind of the background of that. Yeah, these, um, these are very tough decisions that I have to make and provide me with a lot of sleepless nights to tell you the truth. Um, typically, any type of regulation or order that I've ever made in the past has been evidence-based and data-driven. And um, you know, with this being a very novel disease and the first pandemic I've ever lived through, um, it, it's hard making these decisions without having done, you know, a year's worth of research or having, you know, 10 years worth of data to look at um, and having to think about negative consequences or outcomes that can come from these types of decisions that I make. Um, but all in all, you know, my job is to um, look out for the welfare of our community, our, you know, our constituents, the people who have businesses here, their employees. It's a big undertaking. And um, I don't, I, I know a lot of people, I've, I've gotten a lot of criticism about overstepping or going too far. But at the end of this, if all I have to say is I'm sorry for, you know, trying to pet, protect the health and welfare of my community, I'm willing to own that, but I am making these decisions based off the evidence and the um, the little evidence that I have today, knowing and my my education, knowing how disease spreads. I feel like the decisions that I'm making are necessary at this point in time. It's you know, if I wait for the guidance to come down, as Councillor Nash had mentioned from the CDC or um, the the governor. I feel like sometimes it's just too late. Like we, I even feel sometimes, you know, I know I was out on the front lines doing um, COVID Q and A's and making decisions that were, you know, prior to anyone thinking about doing them. And um, it, it's, it is with a heavy heart. I, I just, it's hard for me to answer that, you know, I'm, I'm a, scientist, database driven type of person, public health professional. And without that, um, I'm just going on what I know on what, how pandemic spread um, and trying to reduce transmission within our community, to just doing the best I can. Um, I have a great consortium of um, colleagues. I have, you know, um, the director of infection control is the chair of my board of health that I rely on heavily for these decisions. Um, so that's all I can say to that. I, I'm sorry if it wasn't as articulate as I wanted it to be, but there, it's tough. Thank you for that um, that answer, which was quite articulate. Um, Councillor Thorpe. Thank you very much, Councillor Sierra. Um, Meredith, thank you very much for being here this evening. Quick question regarding the shelter. Are you still accepting donations through the uh, Northampton Fire Department at 26 Carlin Drive in Northampton? Yes, we are. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, I'll just also note, Alan Wolf from the mayor's office pointed out that if you go to the COVID-19 page on the city's website, there, uh, there's in the left-hand column, um, at the very bottom, it says ways you can help. And so a lot of this information and um, is on that page, but also the, the ways that you can um, volunteer and um, things that are needed are all consolidated there. Um, uh, Councillor Dwight. Hi, Meredith, um, I think it's important to point out that um, you have nothing to apologize for. I think the fact that 
Well, first of all, there is evidence that your vigilance has actually paid off, given the descriptions that we just heard. And to err on the side of caution makes much more sense. No one's liberties are being terrifically constrained or being inconvenienced. And the fact is that for the most part, I've noticed that this community is willing to comply and understands the reasons and motivations. And I think uh, you've made wise, judicious, and appropriately uh, protective decisions. So I, I'm, I appreciate you explaining yourself, but I, I really don't think it's necessary. Thank you, Councillor Dwight. Um, Councillor Jarrett. Uh, Meredith, going back to the shelter, you mentioned that the shelter is full, and I was curious if you know how many people are turned away um, or if there are any other options for folks that, that aren't able to stay there. Sure. Um, so we have turned away. We've had, we've had some homeless people that have come all the way from Worcester, from Berkshire County, from Amherst. Um, again, because of the limitations of the shelter size, we've had to turn away at least 12 people to date that I know of. Um, Amherst currently does have Craig's door still open and it will be open till April 30th. So they do have a place to go to in Amherst. Um, sometimes it's just communication um, from the hospital level saying that they need to go to a shelter and they're automatically directed to the Northampton um, shelter. There is a shelter that's opened up in Pittsfield and Greenfield and Springfield that I know of. I'm not sure if they're at capacity or not or what their restrictions or limitations are, but they're all there are alternative shelters. Thank you. Um, I'm also going to note on that same page, the COVID-19 information page on the city's website, um, in addition to the volunteer opportunities, there's a button or a tab for um, how you can donate and the different ways to donate. Right now, we're um, because of the order that was uh, became effective 1201 today, the um, face covering order that you must wear a face cover. Um, if you go into any essential business or if you're employed there and you can't socially or adequately provide social distancing, um, we're in great need of these face coverings. Today we went live with um, a, a worksheet that you can put in a request for these face coverings and we're at over a thousand requests right now and we have limited supplies. The partnership with Cooley Dickinson Hospital is amazing. They are the recipients of the donations. They launder them, they package them in a very sterile way, and then they provide them to me and we, we distribute them. But we don't have a fraction of what we need to go around at this point. Um, Meredith, along those lines, I had a question today that the mayor was nice enough to answer for me uh, from someone who was wondering if, if they couldn't access that, um, that sheet for requests, um, if they could, who they could contact to request a mask and how they could get it if, let's say, they didn't have um, computer access. And so he recommended that they call your, your office, so they called the Northampton Health Department, um, and then they would arrange a time to come pick one up. We deliver them, so oh. nobody, yeah, nobody has to come here to pick them up. So right, you can call 413-587-1214 to request as many masks that you need. And then we ask where they can be delivered to. We don't enter anyone's house. So we ask, we ask you to provide instructions where to drop them off, either a mailbox, a front porch, something like that. Mm -hmm. We started delivering today. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, counselors, we want to let Meredith go. So any last questions? I don't see any. Um, Meredith, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, we really, I can't begin to express how uh, grateful we are for your amazing work. Um, always, but at this time, you, um, you know, in your field, you train for this, but you don't really expect to experience it. So um, thank you for all that you've done and all you're doing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Day. Thank you so much. Okay, Mayor Narkowitz. 
Uh, good evening, uh, Council President and members of the Council and members of the public. Um, again, let me just echo my incredible thanks and gratitude to toward uh, uh, Public Health Director uh, Meredith O'Leary, who has um, been at the front lines of uh, leading our city's response uh, to this unprecedented pandemic. Um, and obviously, we're proud of the work that uh, she and her department and our city has been able to do in terms of uh, trying to uh, protect residents and give them information, um, and in some cases, um, make decisions out ahead of other communities, um, and sometimes the governor and sometimes, well, certainly ahead of the president. Um, but, um, but I just want to thank her again publicly for the work she's doing. Um, the city uh, is uh, doing its best uh, to adapt to this new environment in which we're working in and have been working in now for several weeks. Um, we continue to provide uh, services, um, obviously in a somewhat limited uh, fashion uh, through all of our city departments. Um, we uh, obviously are one of our major focuses, our public safety uh, departments, our police and fire rescue and dispatch um, and public works. Um, are continuing to operate and continuing to serve the public. Um, obviously, we're doing our best to provide them uh, with uh, PPE. Uh, you've heard about some of the limitations on PPE as it, as it pertains to uh, healthcare workers. Uh, we've experienced some of those same limitations in the supply chains. Um, and our source is through NEMA, uh, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. So we've been working uh, very closely with NEMA uh, to try to uh, restock um, and make sure that uh, our first responders um, have access to this equipment. Um, many of our uh, ambulances respond to calls that are you know, COVID suspicious or someone who's experiencing COVID-like symptoms. So obviously we wanna make sure that they're protected um, at all times. Um, in terms of um, the, uh, you have mentioned the website and, and I wanna just keep uh, pushing that out to people. Um, we have a very comprehensive uh, website about COVID-19 and all of the various facets, whether it's the orders that Meredith has been issuing, um, we compile uh, the governor's orders, we compile CDC information, um, we compile information on a daily basis. So it's really an excellent clearinghouse um, for Northampton residents. And that's obviously, you just go to, NorthamptonMA.gov slash COVID-19, um, and it'll take you there. Or you just go to the homepage and the flashing emergency COVID-19 light um, is right there on the top of the page and you can access it that way. Um, I continue to remain in close contact with um, state uh, and federal officials um, as we uh, obviously look to them for uh, resources and support. Um, I was on a call yesterday uh, with the Lieutenant Governor and mayors across the state, um, as well as the Secretary of Administration and Finance. I'll talk a little bit more about the financial piece um, during the Finance Committee meeting, um, but we continue to emphasize um, how we've received some aid, and you've heard about um, our efforts to stand up a, a small business assistance program, um, and obviously the work we're doing around the shelter. Um, but um, at this point, we're, we really, uh, we are hopeful that there will be more resources to follow um, because this is going to be a long and significant recovery period um, that we will have to go through. So um, we continue to work on that front as well. Um, again, as I said, uh, my office is fully functioning in a remote uh, capacity. Um, so you can call or email my office for information. Um, and we have staff that are, that are responding remotely. All of our administration and finance uh, continues to operate um, through skeleton crews and through remote. Um, and uh, obviously all of our other city agencies uh, to the extent possible, particularly our social service agencies, our veteran services and our senior services, um, while they are not open, um, they are very busy uh, doing outreach and support uh, to their constituents um, who in many cases are among the most vulnerable during this crisis. Um, so that's a quick overview. Um, I can answer questions or I can also just allow you to start your meeting um, and we can continue to talk uh, about the financial piece when that comes along. Um, so I guess counselors, if, if you have any questions that are not 
financial, you know, not related to the financial part that's on the agenda. Um, let's uh, maybe ask them now. So I see Councillor Foster. Hi, Mayor. Um, first, I just want to say, again, I think the city's response to this has been nothing short of astounding. I've been um, just really impressed department by department by the work that's being done. So I, I wanted to name that and really blew me away when we had that snowstorm a couple of weeks ago and there was DPW out there clearing the streets um, in the midst of everything they're dealing with. Very impressive. One question I had for you, it's um, not a financial one. Is there some concern that there are not enough restrooms um, in town for folks who are homeless and who are taking advantage of the shelter? I know there's the porta potties um, down by the bike path and I, I, I am really grateful that they're there. Um, but I'm wondering if you know of other alternatives or if there's anything that can be done to provide more um, bathroom access to folks who, who are living without homes right now. Yeah, that's, um, that is obviously a concern. And we do, we do have some, we had some porta potties that were uh, placed somewhat strategically where we knew some folks were living um, near the bike path. Um, um, we are, I was in uh, part of our call, uh, emergency management call today. Uh, we are going to put another porta potty up on Main Street. Um, actually, we're going to put it um, alongside of City Hall, um, uh, near where the entrance that people typically use to use the bathroom um, at City Hall. Um, we're also working on a hand washing, a better hand washing arrangement. Uh, we, what we've heard, and this is apparently commonplace, that, um, and this happens even on construction sites, that um, porta potties are put out and there's a dispenser of hand sanitizer and the hand sanitizer quickly gets stolen um, during this period of hoarding of hand sanitizer. Uh, so, um, so we are working on having a Main Street, uh, uh, something that's more visible to people who are on Main Street. I also know that um, uh, I believe, I think it's Edwards Church um, has re- uh, First Churches. First Churches, sorry, my bad. First Churches has, um, has uh, uh, opened to allow bathroom access um, during some limited hours as well um, on the other side of Main Street. So uh, we are cognizant of that um, and we are working to, um, to address that. So there will be some additional outdoor facilities going in this time on Main Street as well as the First Churches option. Councillors, other questions for the mayor at this point? Okay, seeing none, um, what we're gonna do is we are going to um, thank you, <laughs> Mayor Narquitz. Um, And hold on, my screen just changed. I need to readjust. <laughs> so Laura's just shared the agenda. We are going to um, get back to our agenda. We've already convened, um, but what we're now going to do is, although we're still gonna stay present, we're going to recess the council's participation for public comment. Um, so if you are watching and you wanna participate in public comment, please go to the city's website, um, northamptonma.gov, and access the login information from the posted agenda for this meeting or under the news section. Um, if you know that you wish to make a public comment, if you can please use the raise hand feature. To raise your virtual hand, you click on the participants um, button, which is at the bottom of this horizontal menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, and that will open up a window uh, that shows the participants of this meeting. At the bottom of that window, there is some, there, you'll see a raise hand feature. Um, if you are calling in by telephone and you would like to uh, participate and um, you wanna raise your hand, you can actually raise your hand over the telephone by hitting star nine. Um, if you're having trouble though, there's also a chat feature, which is down at that same uh, horizontal menu bar, uh, feel free to chat directly to me and I will try and help you out or I'll, I'll acknowledge you. So what, how this is gonna work is I'm gonna unmute each raised hand one by one. 
and ask if you would like to make a comment. Um, and if your video is not on, ask if you'd like your video to be on. You may comment with or without video. When you begin, please state your name and your city or town for public comment, for the public record. Um, to ensure everyone has equal opportunity to speak, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. After three minutes, I will ask you to please finish your sentence. According to our council rules, we don't respond during public comment as it's your time to speak. That's why we have recessed our participation. Um, so while your comments should be directed to us, you'll understand when we don't respond. You may speak on any topic. It doesn't need to be an item on the agenda, but as this is an open meeting where anyone can come on, I will do my best to act quickly if someone is clearly acting in a way that's inappropriate or outside of what we would expect in council chambers. Um, and I will remove anyone if I feel they need to be removed from the meeting. Uh, if you don't wish to make a comment, we ask that you watch on channel 15 or by streaming on Northampton Open Media. The recording of this meeting will be available at Northampton Open Media's government video archive channel on YouTube. Um, I thank them for being wonderful partners with us during this time and always, and for ensuring that the public has the same access while we're remote as they always have had. Um, so uh, I'll also remind people that we're always happy to receive comments by email and that those are part of the public record. So please email us at city council at northamptonma.gov. So we're gonna start the real-time public comment. Once public comment is concluded, we will reconvene the meeting. Um, anyone from the public who remains on Zoom will no longer be recognized for participation um, or unmuted during the meeting and their video will be turned off. So I am going to, um, well, Councillor Dwight, do you have, hold on, okay. There we go. Just a caution, if you're calling in by phone, you'll be identified on the screen by your phone number. If you want to keep that anonymous, log in with a name or something, so that because this will be recorded, it's being brought, it's being streamed, and uh, people have an opportunity to see your phone number. If you're okay with that, then fine, but that's just so in, in the interest of uh, informed consent. Excellent point, thank you. Okay, so I see two hands up. Um, first is Javier Luengo Garrido. Um, I'm gonna unmute you, and your video's on, so um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Javier Longo Garrido. I live in War 3, 27 Northern Avenue. I'm here to speak on behalf of the resolution denouncing anti-Asian, anti-Asian American and xenophobic discrimination today. Um, I'm the coordinator of the Immigrant Protection Project of the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts. Um, the council time that I gave testimony in front of this city council or the previous city council last year was in December. I was here uh, speaking on behalf and supporting the safe city ordinance that the city council voted unanimously to pass. And that ordinance was meant to, pr was made in to protect immigrants and to create the necessary trust between the city departments and the immigrant community. Before that, in 2014, Mayor Narkowitz uh, passed the city policy order, also intended to protect immigrants. Sadly, in the same way how now we hear coming from the White House um, and using a nationwide uh, platform, people feeling that they can start invalidate, normalize racism and hatred, uh, we see again and again the necessity for local cities and municipalities to have to reinstate and re-engage with their population, with their immigrant population, in a in a way that makes them feel safe, makes them feel welcome, and also tell it's it's a, it's a city council responsibility to keep telling the residents that they are the city council is there for them. Um, as as an immigrant protection project coordinator, I would like to ask the Northampton City Council to support this resolution to keep making a statement after statement that racism, bigotry, and hatred 
do not have a space in our city, in our commonwealth, in our nation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment. Um, next, there, uh, Megan is next. Let me, okay, you should be all set. Hey, good evening, uh, Council President, um, Councilors, uh, Mayor, and fellow participants. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'll try to speak quickly to stay within the time limit. So um, I'm a member of the Human Rights Commission and a naturalized citizen of Chinese descent. I was born in Taiwan. And I'm here also to support the resolution denouncing racialized hostility against Asians and Asian Americans. I want to address the people who may be feeling slightly skeptical about the relevance of this resolution when there are so many currently suffering from dislocation, economic hardships, and health crises. Maybe you wonder if we really experience racism in the sort of chronic, traumatic way acknowledged by many other racial groups. Um, does that, did that really happen to you is a common reaction when I bring up examples of racism. Uh, you meaning apparently professional, educated, financially secure East Asian American. But depending on which historical moment we're living through, um, Asians are considered either part of the problem grouped with the white majority or the problem. Um, and now the COVID-19 pandemic is tied to its or country of origin and people of Asian descent. So at present, we may not be aware of local incidents of harassment or violence against a relatively small number of us that are of East Asian descent. Um, thank Mr. Wengo Garrido for speaking specifically to that. Um, but your consideration of this resolution should be guided by our rejection of this country's history of xenophobia. Codified into laws against Chinese who were maligned as disease vectors long before 2020. Our white supremacist POTUS is feeding the climate of race-based scapegoating and once again emboldening a coast-to-coast -coast spree of hate and rage that spans verbal humiliation and threats, spitting and punching, knifing of a Texan father and two children that look Chinese. Why wait until you hear about local incidents egregious enough to be reported and labeled hate crimes before demonstrating support and solidarity with our residents? An analogy keeps coming to my mind. Those in power should not have waited for COVID-19 infection rates to spike before sensing urgency and taking action. Know that passing the resolution now does not diminish your concerns in our collective efforts to combat insidious over racism against other minority groups in this era of coronavirus fears. We know about the dangerous racial profiling of dark-skinned men when they wear the mandatory face coverings. In Springfield, a man tried to torch a Jewish nursing home this month. Who can ignore the fact that African-American and Latinx people are dying disproportionately of COVID-19 due to a lifetime of institutionalized racism? We Northamptonites purport to stand up for racial, ethnic, religious minorities that are disproportionately targeted. My hope is that this resolution is one of many actions like the Safe City Ordinance that reaffirms our regard for all residents that are American people of color and immigrants documented or not. And this resolution is a message that there's zero tolerance for hatred against anyone, even Asians and Asian Americans. Thank you for your time. Thank you very, very much, Megan, for those comments. Um, is there anybody else from the public who would like to participate in public comment? Um, I'm not seeing any other hands, but I don't want to move on from this until I'm really sure that there's no one else who wants to speak to us. Um, so I'm gonna give it another minute. I don't see any chats. Um, hopefully you, you all are seeing the raise hand feature. If it's not working for you, uh, come on and let me know. Um, 
but okay, I don't see anybody else. Um, so thank you for uh, those comments. Um, and we are going to return from recess um, and uh, join the meeting again. Um, okay, thank you. And so again, anybody who um, is from the public is not a counselor or from the city, I am gonna, um, you're not gonna be able to be unmuted. Um, and I will probably turn off your video once I can figure out how to do it just because um, it's uh, sort of like how it would be in the council chambers. It's now focused on the council. Um, so thank you so much for participating. And we are going to move to um, updates. So updates from council uh, chair, from committee chairs um, or one minute announcements if there are no chair updates. Uh, I'm okay, Councillor Labarge. Whoops, Councillor, my screen view keeps changing. Sorry. It's okay. It's not your fault, it's the <laughs> program. Okay, let me find you. Councillor Labarge, there you are. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I just wanted to give an announcement, please, um, that our May 4th City Service Committee meeting has been canceled since we don't have new appointments. So we've made the decision to go ahead and cancel that. But I'm also requesting as the chair that the other three counselors who are on the Committee of City Service to seriously think about who we would like to bring in at one of the departments to come in and speak for the month of June. Hopefully the doors will be open. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Labarge. Um, next, Councillor Quinlan, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I really, uh, my one minute announcement is just uh, to express my gratitude and admiration uh, to Councillor Labarge, we had our city services meeting at the beginning of March. It was on March 2nd. And even prior to that, I think it was three weeks before that in discussion, she asked for Meredith to come to our meeting and discuss uh, the coronavirus and the city's preparation of that. And, you know, I've been just stunned as this whole thing has snowballed and we've seen the, the reaction in our community that Councillor Labarge was thinking about that back at the beginning of February is very impressive. And I just wanted to thank her for that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to go to, to Councillor Foster first, and then we'll come back to you, Councillor Labarge. Oh, Councillor Quinlan, I'm glad you said that. I had similar thoughts um, to that. So um, I'll echo what Councillor Quinlan said. And just a quick um, one minute announcement. Um, I wanted to um, say that the Northampton Kiwanis Club is um, partnering with Steve Connors and Veteran Services. Um, David Starr, who owns Berkshire Naturals, is helping to transport food boxes from the Salvation Army in um, Springfield uh, to surrounding towns to get food um, to veterans who need uh, food access and who may be homebound. Uh, it's a pretty impressive operation uh, that the Kiwanis and Berkshire Naturals and Veteran Services have undertaken uh, really beginning this week. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Councilor Labarge, I'm gonna go back to you real quick because I know, I think you maybe had something else you wanted to say and then I will go to Councilor Mayori. Thank you, Councilor Shira. Um, just for a one minute announcement, please. I would like to commend a resident in Ward 6 who lives on Lady Slipper Lane, Mary and Gowry. She has made masks for the whole fire department in the police department in Northampton. She called me about th three weeks ago and asked if I needed any for my household. I told her, sure, that's fine. So we have three of them. She called me back a half hour later and she said, I wanna help you make masks for your residents. So as a counselor, I've been going out and first of all, calling my high risk residents and we have passed out 25 in Ward 6A and 6B already. And on Easter morning, I got a call 
former resident in Ward 5 off of Florence Road. Him and his wife needed one very, very badly. So I went over there as a counselor and they were so happy to have them because they had ordered some and been waiting for almost like two and a half weeks and their order didn't come in. So I think a lot of people in this city really needs to be recognized for all the work that they're doing. And also as a counselor, if anybody has any white elastic, we're looking for some in Ward 6 because we wanna make more masks. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Maori. Hey there, yeah. In light of what we're going to, uh, what, the, what some in the public comment um, have addressed and what we'll be discussing later with the resolution, um, I wanted to bring everyone's attention to a, a free, um, this is a free um, bystander training program to combat um, anti-Asian, anti-Asian anti American and xenophobic harassment. Here's the website. They have like a dozen trainings. Um, they're excellent trainings. I hope you can see that. And they're free. And um, I did I did one, there was a thousand people on it. It's, uh, it's great information. Um, because um, it can be transferred to any type of, um, any kind of real transgression when you're out in public. And I know a lot of us struggle with this, but the studies show that um, something that really lessens the impact to those being targeted is people um, appropriately um, standing up um, and speaking out and, and helping. And so uh, it can be confusing to know what to do. And this training's excellent at, um, helping you know when to, to, to intervene, how to intervene, and how to keep everyone safe, including the person or persons being targeted. So I hope you'll take advantage of them. Hold up. <laughs> Hold it up a little bit higher. There we go. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, Council of the Barge. No, I'm all set. Oh, OK, sorry. I forgot to lower your hand. Uh, any? other announcements from counselors? Okay, seeing none, um, we are going to move on to um, resolutions. And as we've heard, we do have a resolution on the agenda for this evening. So, I, uh, it's 20.045, a resolution denouncing anti-Asian, uh, anti-Asian American and xenophobic discrimination. I'm going to read it. Uh, in the year 2020, upon the recommendation of Councillor Karen Foster and Councillor Rachel Maori, um, our 20.045, a resolution denouncing anti-Asian, anti-Asian American and xenophobic discrimination, be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows, whereas the Northampton City Council has passed a resolution declaring Northampton's commitment to being a safe and accepting community on November 17th, 2016, as well as a resolution regarding hate crimes on February 21st, 2013, and whereas the use of anti-Asian terminology and rhetoric related to COVID-19, such as, quote, Chinese virus, and quote, quote, Wuhan virus, and quote, and Kung and quote Kung flu and quote have perpetuated anti-Asian stigma, and whereas the use of anti-Asian rhetoric, including by our current U.S. president and top federal officials, has resulted in people of Asian descent being harassed, assaulted, and scapegoated for the COVID-19 pandemic throughout the U.S., including in our own community. And whereas since January 2020, there has been a dramatic increase nationwide in reports of hate crimes and harassment of those of Asian descent. With the online reporting forum Stop Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders AAPI Hate logging in more than 1,100 reports of incidents of racial harassment and discrimination in the United States. And whereas the Northampton City Council has established as stated in the November 17th, 2016 resolution declaring Northampton's commitment to being a safe and accepting community that it believes in the quote, rights of people to lead lives of peace and dignity, free from fear, harassment, and violence, end quote. Now, therefore, be it resolved 
that the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts calls on all local public officials to condemn and denounce any and all anti-Asian sentiment in any form in and around the city. Be it further resolved that the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts recognizes that the health, safety, and dignity of all residents, no matter their background, must be of the utmost priority. Be it further resolved that the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts stands with our Asian and Asian American neighbors and business community. Be it further resolved that the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts condemns all manifestations of anti-Asian anti racism, xenophobia, discrimination, and scapegoating. Be it further resolved that the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts calls on the United States leadership to combat misinformation and discrimination and puts Asian Americans that puts Asian Americans at risk and to commit to building a more inclusive, diverse, and tolerant society. Be it further resolved that the administrative assistant to the city council shall cause a copy of this resolu resolution to be sent to President Donald Trump, U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren, U.S. Senator Ed Markey, U.S. Senator Kamala Harris, U.S. Representative Grace Mang, Congressman James McGovern, Massachusetts Governor Charles Baker, State Senator Joanne Comerford, and State Representative Lindsay Sabajosa. Um, so that is the resolution. Um, so what I am looking for now is a motion. Oh, Councillor Dwight, what's up? You can't unmute. Here we go. All right, sorry, I moved to approve. <laughs> We're all gonna die of old age if I, yeah. I move to approve, please. Second. I second it. I heard at least three seconds. I'm gonna go with Councillor Thorpe, I think. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna let the sponsors lead the discussion. So um, if they would like. So yeah, so Councillor Mayori, I see you nodding. Okay, yes. I just really wanted to give a little bit of a framing to this resolution. Um, I know sometimes people question um, when and how to use resolution. So um, I want to first say that, of course, you know, history has shown us that anti-Asian and anti-Asian American harassment and discrimination are, are not new. Um, but there is a alarming surge of um, anti-Asian uh, racism being reported. Uh, researchers are finding a significant surge in the last two months. Um, the FBI is confirming that Chinese and Asian Americans are now experiencing increased hate crimes due to the corona uh, global outbreak um, from being stabbed and spit on and attacked to other um, uh, things like fought, being followed, stared down, verbally assaulted. Um, so, you know, and, and also to remember that um, these types of, um, this type of harassment is typically way underreported. Um, uh, so I think the thing that a resolution can do in this situation is to really bring to light what is happening and, and to, to let people here in Northampton in our community know that residents of Asian descent are reporting being harassed here in the Valley in real time. Uh, this isn't something that's just happening in other places. Uh, and this is what those reports from residents are what turn the drafting of this resolution. Uh, and there's a little bit of a tone about, well, we need to concentrate on the, the COVID outbreak. This is, you know, but I think that's something, it's, it's another way, it's another type of aggression to always put on the back burner, the kind of psychological and physical well being of, um, of people of color. Um, so I would like to, I just think, especially in the light of the failures we, we've seen at the federal level on this, um, where our, you know, our, our president um, and other federal officials have actually contributed to, not mitigated, um, anti-Asian sentiment and racism. Uh, I think it's even more important that all, all leaders um, down to city government uh, speak out collectively um, to this rising trend to assure our Asian and Asian American, as well as immigrant residents, that that we are behind them and we see them. Um, a couple of other uh, things about this resolution: it's um, there is a similar um, resolution that's been put forth by Representative um, 
Grace Meng to the U.S. House, House, and that's why she's noted in the resolution, as well as Senator Kamala Harris, who wrote a companion resolution for, um, for the Senate, the U.S. Senate. Um, and lastly, I just want to say, you know, what I was saying in my um, bystander announcement, you know, studies show that, that speaking up um, to racism and hate crimes and, and micro and macro aggressions really lessens the psychological fallout on people being targeted. And conversely, not speaking up raises the trauma level. So this is something we can do. And um, I think things like this resolution actually fit in into kind of a collective, collective bystander response as, as, city, as city leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Foster, would you? Yeah, um, I'd like to, to start by recognizing uh, Councilor Maori's leadership and work on bringing this resolution to pass. Um, you know, she really kind of drove this bus and very proud to be a part of it. Um, you know, when, when this was starting, um, a friend of mine who is of Asian descent, who, who lives in Northampton, uh, mentioned how she had seasonal allergies and was trying very hard not to cough in public um, because it's a very uh, bad time to be presenting um, as Asian and coughing in public. Um, you know, real, real awareness. Um, there was a 2017 uh, study done by NPR um, regarding sort of where um, Asian Americans and people of Asian descent fit in the, the kind of culture that we talk about of racism in this country. And one of the things that, that was identified is that, um, you know, kind of in general, people who are Asian American or of Asian descent are more likely to face individual acts of racism rather than the systemic barriers that are often faced by other groups. And that's not to say that the systemic barriers and racism isn't there, um, but it tends to be more individualized. And so uh, an opportunity now, and I think the reports that we're hearing of tend to be of that individualized um, nature of people not feeling safe or people feeling watched or looked at or um, scrutinized, um, you know, and, and being very aware of, of being, you know, of how they're presenting. Um, and as, as Rachel said, I just want to echo, I think, or excuse me, Council Mayori said, and I'd like to echo, um, that importance of local leaders speaking out, and in particular, um, the importance of people who are of the, the dominant group speaking up and speaking out. Um, you know, I think that um, people who experience harassment, um, it's bad enough to experience that harassment, but then to have to report it um, can add another level of trauma or to have to be the ones to, to raise the issue and, and be the ones to speak up about it. Um, so I, I really think there's importance of us, um, you know, kind of taking that on and, and, and being at the forefront of that. Thank you. Other counselors who'd like to comment? I see Councillor Labarge's hand up. Hi, Councillor. <laughs> You're all set. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Shira. Um, I want to talk about this um, resolution. I will support it 100%. As a city councillor, and you're talking about racism and that, I've been through that in my family because of being Greek. And, you know, in 2016, a resolution that was declared from us councillors had a lot of language in it that just hit you right in the heart. And it was being a safe and accepting community that it believes in the rights of people to lead lives of peace and dignity from fear, harassment, and violence. That is extremely important to me because of my race and my family. It hits you right in the heart. And I also have to say the other part of this resolution, Councillor Shira, is that we're gonna be recognizing that the health, the safety and dignity of all residents, no matter your background, that's extremely important, must be of utmost priority. I, I, I would like to know 
maybe from one of the sponsors, Council, um, Rachel Muir. Has this happened already in Northampton? Because I have not heard about this and I'm hoping it has not. Could you answer that, Councillor Muir? Um, I'll, I'll let you answer that and then we've got other councillors who'd like to speak. So, Councillor Muir. Sure. Yeah, uh, so so Council Labarge, uh, the resolution, uh, the idea was drafted after I received uh, reports from residents of um, harassment um, around uh, residents of Asian descent being harassed in this time, this COVID pandemic. In our city of Northampton? Yes. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Councillor Dwight. Um. The first time that um, I actually, we had to deal with this as a body while I was sitting on it was uh, in 2001, after the World Trade Towers came down. We drafted a resolution um, in response to a number of assaults and also the rhetoric um, from Washington, from the presidency again, uh, targeting people of Middle Eastern descent or perceived Middle Eastern descent um, um, or of a particular faith. And it, it's kind of shameful that we, here we are, we're almost 20 years later and another crisis has struck the country and there are people whose tendency is to um, target people and use them as the focus of their ire and it is the definition of bigotry. It is, the, it is uh, attacking a group, a cultural group, as if they bear the responsibility in any way for the problems that we're experiencing. And the one thing with this, with the pandemic, that one would hope was that, that it would actually be a unifying um, event, given the fact that no one is left unscathed. There is no one who was specially protected from this. Yet we see we have uh, a president and a party that supports the president who um, feel that it's, it's a politically expedient advantage to target any group to, to, uh, to deflect blame, responsibility and accountability and it is this, I'm grateful to the sponsors very much. I mean, uh, Councilor Maori and Councilor Foster, this could not come at a more appropriate time. This is the definition of what a resolution is. It's a resolution is, is speaking uh, in as loud a way as possible that this body can, uh, speaking up for community members that uh, are vulnerable. I, and to the extent that, um, you know, it is merely a resolution that doesn't carry the weight of law, it does express probably maybe something hopefully that's even a little stronger, which is our collective will. And I don't doubt that this is going to receive a unanimous approval on the vote. And I hope, uh, it's, I mean, it's very distressing to hear Council Mayor report that uh, this is prompted by actual incidents that have occurred here in the city. That means our neighbors, there are our neighbors who subscribe to this uh, venality and grotesque human behavior. And whatever we can do to decry that, I'm, I'm all for, and thank you very much for uh, giving us this resolution. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Quinlan, then Councillor Thorpe. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much to uh, Councils Mayori and Foster for bringing this resolution. This is, uh, you know, when I read it the other day, uh, I had a question for you and asked and we had a, you know, I felt really great about what I read, what I understand about this and your reasoning for putting it forward. Um, you know, I thought back to uh, our swearing in ceremony and the Reverend Dr. Avazian saying to us to, to really think about people on the margins, really think about people that are being uh, put in a position uh, that, that the, the overall community maybe doesn't realize what they're going through. And I think that that's one thing that Northampton 
uh, you know, I admire about the city and, and, and love living here because I think we try to treat everyone justly. We care for people. And so I'm grateful for this resolution because of that and support it 100%. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Councillor Sierra. Um, I just want to take a moment and um, talk briefly with having experienced ra racism and having witnessed racism. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor Foster and Councillor Mary for bringing this forward. I also like to thank Megan and um, Javier who spoke earlier this evening passionately about this resolution and to um, quote an individual who um, spent numerous times in uh, jail and when he was in Birmingham, Alabama, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, said it best with this quote here is that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I'm gonna be happy to uh, support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jarrett. Thank you, Councillor Maori, Councillor Foster for introducing this. Um, I just wanna second what you said Councillor Maori, that this this will help give more people the courage to speak up when they're bystanders, and that includes times when you know you're overhearing someone, when people are hearing people they know um, saying anti-Asian uh, rhetoric, um, to be able to speak up then and to, to counter some of that. Um, so I really appreciate uh, and will support this. Thank you. Councillor Nash. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, first, I got a very strong letter of support from this from constituent Lori Loizel, and I would like to read real briefly uh, what she says at the end of her letter. I support the sentiments contained in the resolution specifically condemning anti-Asian sentiment scapegoating and discrimination in any form in and around our city, as well as any misinformation um, and discrimination that puts Asian Americans at risk and endorsing our ongoing commitment to build a more inclusive, diverse and tolerant society. And those are the words of Lori Loizel. And I think she frames how I feel about this as well. Um, and that um, I also, I want to add that, um, that I, I appreciated what Megan said about um, how that this, this is going to be an emerging trend that, um, that, you know, like the coronavirus, we're, we're getting in front of something here that the, the president will increasingly over his campaign be pointing to anti he'll he'll be raising anti-asian uh rhetoric uh, around his mistakes of, of not being in front of the the crisis we're all dealing with right now he's looking for ways to point the finger and i we can expect to hear a lot more of this and um and that this um that this resolution frames how um that you know we we need to stand up to this this onslaught that, that will be coming in the next six months. Thank you. And I will be supporting it. Thank you for that sad but excellent point. Um, counselors, any other comments? Okay, seeing, uh, seeing none, I'm just gonna add my, um, my thanks for this resolution. I think you all know my belief in resolutions. Um, and I echo Councillor Dwight's words about the timing and the, the importance of this one. Um, you know, when we wrote the reference 2016 resolution uh, declaring Northampton's commitment to be a safe and accepting community, I was horrified by the increase in hate speech. And um, at that time, and the idea that Trump's election somehow sanctioned it, uh, that horror has only grown in these years. Um, but, you know, nothing really brings it home like hearing about it at home. And those feelings um, are really compounded by the fact that this is happening a around an already tragic and, and sad and really traumatic time. Um, I'm, so I'm just, I'm, I'm deeply sorry. 
And, uh, you know, I, I stand with you in denouncing it. And, and I thank the residents that spoke during public comment and that have brought this to the fore. Um, and, I, and I thank very much the sponsors for doing that as well. So um, thank you. Uh, if there are no other comments, then um, Laura, when you're ready, roll call, please. Laura, you're muted. Oh, sorry, Laura, you're muted. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. That passes in first reading. Um, so thank you. Uh, now we are going to, we have, we are now at the, if I skip over anything, don't hesitate to tell me we've done a lot of moving around. So I want to make sure I'm not missing anything, but I believe we are now at the consent agenda. Yes. Uh, there is just one item on the consent agenda. Would anyone like it removed for discussion? Move to approve the consent agenda, please. Motion's been made. Second. And seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Um, Laura, when yes. you're ready, a roll call, please. Okay, sure. Um, Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Okay, the consent agenda has been approved and we will now recess for finance. Okay. So, Laura, when you. Sure. Please take the role for finance. Um, Councillor Shara. Here. Councillor Labarge. Here. Councillor Quinlan. Here. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Here. Okay. Uh, first item is approval of minutes from the previous meeting, which was April 2nd, 2020. Move to approve. Motion's been Second. made by Councillor Labarge and seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Quinlan. Quinlan, thank you. Um, all, uh, any discussion on these minutes? Seeing none, roll call please, Laura, when you are ready. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, uh, the minutes are <coughs> approved. Um, so, oh, I see Susan. Hi, Susan. Um, uh, so now the next thing on the agenda is a financial update. We have a presentation from Mayor Narkowitz um, uh, on, with, with a financial update on the impact of COVID-19 on the current budget, next year's, the development of next year's budget, the implementation of the override from uh, March 3rd, which feels like 40 years ago at this point. Um, and the uh, the impact on the capital improvement plan. Um, and we also have finance director yeah. Susan Wright with us um, who present the third quarter financial report. So um, Mayor Narkowitz, I don't know whether you or Susan would like to present first. Um, I think I can present first and, um, and then if there are, you know, then we can, I know it's later in the agenda for the, for the quarterly report, but we can, we can talk about that as well and go through that. I, I don't, I think you'll find that there's not a lot of information in those. Um, but so if Laura would be willing to start the presentation, I know you miss my PowerPoints. You've missed my PowerPoints all these months. So little yeah. did I know I'd be um, having to do a PowerPoint. I thought those days were behind me for a little while, but I thought it would be easier to just kind of put this information 
um, into a presentation. So um, I'll let Laura get that started. Um, can you see it? Here. I can, you just have to start the slideshow. Okay. Um, here we go. It, are you seeing it? We are, yes. Um, I, I oh, think it, is there, there's not audio, right? It's just. No, it's not. But um, typically with a presentation, you go click on slideshow up at the top on the menu. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. From beginning. You can see from the oh. beginning. All right. There gotcha. You go. Thanks. Excellent. Okay. So, um, so uh, you can move to the first. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So basically, I want to go over um, several things this evening. Um, first and foremost, the impact of this COVID-19 uh, emergency on the fiscal year 2020 budget, which we're still in. Obviously, we um, uh, the, the fiscal year for those watching at home runs through June 30th of uh, 2020. Um, so um, we are now entering the fourth, we've entered the fourth quarter, April, May, and June of fiscal year 2020. Um, we do have third quarter revenue and expenditures, which I'll talk about. And then um, Susan Wright afterwards can go through in, in greater detail through those reports that we submit quarterly. Um, Want to talk about the estimated impact on both the third and fourth quarter revenues and expenditures for the general fund. Um, Want to talk to the extent we have information on the potential impacts on state aid uh, in potentially FY20, uh, 20, but more likely in FY 2021, um, the status of the five-year capital improvement program, um, and then um, moving forward, looking forward to the fiscal year 2021 budget, which I am required to submit to the council uh, by May 15th, um, just less than a month away. Um, and again, looking at the potential revenue impact of COVID-19 um, expenditure impact of COVID-19, and then um, uh, uh, going over uh, my intent to delay implementation of the override. So let's go to the first slide, uh, the next slide rather, Laura. So we'll start with the impact on the current fiscal year uh, 2020 budget. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So in terms of third quarter revenues, and you'll, you'll, this is just sort of a 30,000 foot view of those uh, detailed uh, munis printouts, which uh, uh, Finance Director Wright can go through with you um, uh, afterwards. Um, we are showing right now for the third quarter uh, that we're about $365,000 uh, below uh, where we expect it to be. Um, so 71.9% uh, of budgeted revenues have been received um, compared to where we were in the third quarter of 2019, where we had 73.7%. There's several factors that impact could, could be impacting this. And of course, keep in mind that um, you know, the, the, the state of emergency in Massachusetts began um, on the uh, 10th of March. Um, and, um, and so, uh, much of the month of much of the month of March is really the, the tail end of uh, third quarter that will be affected. And there are several things. There's the timing of our revenues uh, being processed in city offices because obviously city offices were closed for the for most of the second half of March, um, which has delayed some of that revenue um, hitting our books. Um, we've um, extended due dates, as some of you uh, may know. I announced that I would implement under the authority given by the, the uh, emergency legislation, um, a delay um, in payment due dates uh, for things like uh, real estate and personal property and excise um, and utilities. Um, many of those in some cases had um, uh, due dates um, in March or April. Uh, those have now been delayed um, uh, to June 1st and, and, and we may not see some of the revenues until uh, June 30th. Um, so that also will, will uh, affect our revenues uh, for the third quarter. Um, and then we shut down our parking system uh, shortly after uh, the closure of all city buildings. Um, and so we have uh, seen with little exception, uh, no parking uh, revenue coming in. Um, so that is significant. And then we've also seen a significant drop in ambulance revenue. Um, uh, uh, President Marcusi referred to it earlier um, 
and I think there was even a story about it today um, in Amherst, um, we have seen uh, a drop off in emergency calls generally. Um, and so that goes for ambulance revenue. So we, our ambulance revenue is about $100,000 uh, behind uh, for the third quarter. So um, even just looking at FY 2020 for the third quarter, uh, we estimate we're about $365,000 behind. The real issue comes as we move into the fourth quarter, which obviously is April, uh, May, and June. Oh, um, oh dear, dear. Um, you got to go back, um, I, Laura. Oops. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'll get it. Now you got to go to slideshow again. Oh, uh, from really? beginning. Or, yeah. Oh, or, dear. Oh, yeah. Dear. Um, perfect. Then, That's right where we need to be. Uh, no, uh, then now I have just to go forward a couple slides. Yeah. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, there we go. So the real impact is going to be in the fourth quarter uh, revenues. Um, and you'll see the top line number there, 1.493 million. Um, uh, so again, the extension of due dates, which will also impact revenues in the fourth quarter. Um, the Again, we project uh, continued park it and parking and ticket revenue losses for April, May, and June. Um, um, with our thinking that with Western Mass sort of behind in terms of our our curve um, that this could go on uh, much longer here in, in Western Mass. Um, hotel motel uh, meals, um, while there are some, obviously some meals still happening, um, many sit down restaurants are closed. Obviously some have spun up into delivery, um, but there are still a large number of, uh, of uh, uh, restaurants that have closed. Um, adult use marijuana, has obviously been shut down. It's important to look at the dates also of how the the actual months of which many of these um, excise taxes are collected. And I talked a lot about this during my town halls, but because of the lag time, so the the fourth quarter uh, in both in hotel, motel, meals, and adult use uh, marijuana are actually for the months of February, March, and April. Um, and again, um, so really, it's about half that quarter that will be affected because about mid-March to the end of April. Um, so, so you know, we're estimating in some cases fifty to thirty-three uh, percent loss of revenue um, for the fourth quarter. Again, extrapolating out the loss of ambulance revenue, um, and then on uh, permits, uh, building, wiring, and plumbing. Uh, while the governor has deemed construction. Um, as essential uh, business, um, there still has been a drop off. Obviously, people aren't saying, "Hey, let's renovate that." You know, let's renovate our kitchen right now, or let's uh, let's put that addition on right now. Um, the kinds of activity that typically might be happening right now um, is not happening. So we're estimating the shortfall there, We're about eighty-six thousand. Um, and the other piece, obviously, is just state aid, which we'll continue to talk about. Um, we don't know whether there'll be any impact on uh, on actual FY20 state aid um, in the middle of the fiscal year. We'll, we'll touch on that later. So again, fourth quarter revenues, we're seeing a shortfall of just under 1.5 million. So if you go to the next slide. So um, uh, one of these, the slide on the right is actually maybe familiar to you. It's one that we showed as part of our uh, January uh, financial update series to the joint meeting of the city council and school committee. Um, and it's a slide where we look at the fact that um, sort of the sort of the source of revenue um, by all the comparison communities. Um, and we often point out that Northampton, with the exception of Longmeadow, uh, receives the lowest percentage of state aid. Um, but um, it is able to rely on one of the largest percentages of local aid, uh, local receipts, um, primarily that we've generated through uh, through the things I just talked about. Um, hotel, strong hotel motel, strong uh, meals, obviously um, adult use uh, cannabis, um, ambulance, other types of revenue. So you see there, um, you know, 14.25 percent of our revenue uh, compared to um, you know the other communities is local. Um, this is um, a good thing in, in terms, in an environment where we're seeing not a lot of um, state aid and not a lot of increases in state aid um, and a fairly small percentage of our budget being uh, funded through state aid. But of course, in this crisis, 
um, those are the very types of local revenues that have been impacted severely uh, by the COVID-19 shutdown. Over on the left, you see kind of an array of the types of revenue that support the general fund budget. Um, you know, the typical real estate, personal property, uh, chapter 70, charter school, veterans benefits, et cetera. The ones that are in red are really ones that are uh, very sensitive to um, economic uh, forces. And that obviously we're experiencing severe economic forces now, uh, recession, um, some might say uh, depression level when you look at the unemployment numbers um, that we are seeing um, in terms of percentages. Um, but down the line, these are all the types of revenues that we are now uh, seeing uh, essentially dry up um, in this uh, COVID-19 emergency. So um, when you add up the FY23 uh, quarter uh, shortfall and the FY20 projected fourth quarter shortfall, um, we, are, we are projecting potentially an estimated revenue loss in the current fiscal year of about uh, 1.8 uh, million or one one million eight hundred and fifty eight thousand. So um, so that presents challenges in terms of how we finish out uh, the current fiscal year. Um, but it's not just estimated revenue, as we'll see in the next slide. If you could move ahead, Laura. So we also, because we are um, uh, battling this COVID nineteen emergency, uh, we are also facing. Um, many unbudgeted expenses, things that were not part of our budget because we were not um, uh, thinking about a worldwide pandemic back in uh, this time last year when we were creating our budget for FY uh, 2020. Um, now, as has, was noted um, by the health director, um, there, there, there are many expenses that we hope will be reimbursed uh, by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And we're keeping very close accounting of all of our COVID-19 related expenses. Um, it will be at 75%. Um, and it's unclear um, whether, what, how many of those expenses uh, will in fact be reimbursed. But you know, things like overtime uh, to cover shifts for uh, those that, have to, that are sick or quarantined um, essential service, uh, particularly in the area of public safety. Um, we are also uh, seeing our uh, health, fire, rescue, police, and other uh, departmental staff um, uh, working uh, long hours and, and in some cases working lots of overtime to try to address uh, this crisis. Um, uh, we're obviously, and that includes you know, standing up the FEMA reimbursement program, uh, working on the CDBG uh, emergency funding program. Um, we also have additional personnel costs related to the fact that we have many workers who are working um, under under these emergency order uh, conditions, um, and they are you know frontline workers. We're seeing additional costs for PPE. Obviously, our PPE supplies have been strained. Disinfectant and cleaning supplies um, that we are using. Um, uh, our custodians um, to keep our, our buildings uh, clean uh, for those workers that are going in. I, I, uh, Meredith didn't mention it. She gave a really detailed presentation, uh, but we've also, we actually have uh, school custodians that are cleaning the shelter and cleaning the bathrooms and the showers um, as part of our effort to stand that shelter up. So those are additional costs. We've incurred some additional costs for technology um, to be able to facilitate uh, this new remote environment and getting um, getting people uh, spun up into uh, uh, working remote with software, hardware, um, uh, uh, electronic signature, other uh, sorts of things. Um, and then obviously there are costs related to the shelter that the city has stood up. We've obviously gotten uh, some, some great uh, contributions and there's been a great partnership with ServiceNet, uh, but the city has put upfront uh, funding uh, to get this uh, shelter off the ground. So, so in addition to the revenue shortfall, we also have a, a number of unbudgeted expenses uh, for COVID-19 that we again are tabulating um, and are having to absorb now in our budget and that hopefully we will see um, reimbursement uh, for us, hopefully 75% of those. So if you go on to the next slide. So impacts of COVID-19 on state aid. Um, as you know, Governor Baker uh, submitted his uh, budget back in January. 
Um, obviously, the world it was in a much different place back in January, and the somewhat um, optimistic outlook of the then uh, uh, revenue um, analysts and the joint revenue committee that looked at um, what what revenue level the state could expect to build its budget has obviously changed. Um, and this is actually the next three slides are slides that I uh, borrowed from MMA. Um, I had a virtual meeting like this with all mayors across the state with the Secretary of Administration and Finance, uh, Heffernan, um, who basically was giving us um, their look. Unfortunately, uh, they do not have a, a clear picture that they can give us right now. This is around the time that the House of Representatives and the House Ways and Means Committee uh, would be releasing a, its version of the state budget. Obviously, um, they are adapting to this new environment, adapting to meeting remotely, um, and it's unclear when uh, they will release what they think will be um, the F. Y 2021 state budget. Um, but at the revenue hearing, they did hold a remote revenue hearing earlier this week um, where they hear, heard from a number of economists and, um, and think tanks and experts that they typically asked to testify. Um, the Mass Taxpayers Foundation uh, forecast about a 14.1% uh, decline or $4.4 billion um, uh, dollar loss of revenue. Um, that could force uh, cuts. Um, the, uh, it's unclear whether the legislature will uh, delay their budget process and not put out a budget, which will obviously make it challenging for uh, cities and towns um, to know what their aid, state aid numbers might be. Um, there's, as you see here, there, the state does have a strong uh, rainy day fund, um, and there are some federal uh, CARES Act monies which have arrived. So. Um, that's uh, one piece of the state revenue and budget outlook. If you can go to the next slide, Laura. There is some history, obviously. We went through the, the uh, Great Recession. Uh, this would have been back in the period between 2008 eight through 2011. Um, obviously, this was a period where uh, both federal, state, and local government uh, faced uh, drastic and severe cuts. Um, and in that case, uh, state tax revenues had dropped by over 10%. Um, unrestricted aid was cut by uh, more than 20%. Um, education aid was some not cut quite as deeply, and, and there had been a federal stimulus package that had been adopted uh, to try to pull the country out of the uh, deep recession it was in. And so education aid was um, uh, at least provided some support. Um, they did actually give us the new local option meals um, and excise tax, um, but obviously those are the types of revenues that are being threatened right now uh, by this crisis. Um, one of the big questions is whether the federal government will do a similar uh, stimulus package um, that, could, uh, that could help us, uh, states like Massachusetts that are facing these severe uh, revenue uh, shortfalls. Um, MMA is obviously working with the National League of Cities and um, and we're working on uh, uh, trying to get legislation passed. There is a bill pending, um, HR 6467, which uh, has, has several Massachusetts co-sponsors uh, that would try to provide direct aid to cities. Um, because without uh, federal aid, uh, the, the Massachusetts budget crisis is going to severe, be severe. And as is often the case, that will then uh, roll downhill to cities and towns um, and, uh, and will uh, worsen our outlook. You can go to the next slide. So um, again, we've review, we review these during budget time and we review them obviously more recently during the, um, you know, during the town hall meetings I held, but about 16.6% .6 of the current FY20 budget uh, comes from state aid. It's about 15.8 million. Um, that includes our chapter 70 aid for education unrestricted general government aid, uh, 4.7 million. Chapter 90 is not really part of our budget, but obviously chapter 90 is another form of state aid that has a significant impact on our ability to do, um, uh, to do uh, road reconstruction. So uh, that just kind of gives you a quick overview, again, as a refresher of what are these types of state aid uh, that could be impacted. Um, 
Unfortunately, as I said, the state is not really providing a lot of information, including whether or not uh, mid-year cuts could be on the table. There is a mechanism, and this did occur uh, during the Great Recession uh, back in uh, 2008, 2009, where state aid, which had been budgeted, was cut uh, during the middle of the fiscal year, uh, which meant cities and towns had to scramble to basically trim their budgets uh, to account for the loss. Um, it did not sound like that was something that was being considered as they are now already into the, the first part of the, of the fourth quarter. Um, but that could just mean that uh, the pain and the cuts might be coming um, in the 2021 budget. Uh, so that remains to be seen. And we'll be obviously keeping a close eye on the legislature and the House Ways and Means Committee to see uh, what they do in the coming weeks. Um, so that's the, that's the status of the state and the state aid. Next slide. So uh, the FY 2021-2025 capital improvement program um, and what we would do in FY 2021. Um, the original uh, capital improvement program uh, was delayed as we were waiting for the outcome of the March 3rd Proposition 2.5 override, um, which was then literally followed um, the following Tuesday by the governor declaring a state of emergency and uh, you know the rest of the story. Um, we're now delaying it because we're just, we, we, we need to understand what the budget projections are relative to those local receipts I talked about and state aid um, and, um, and wanting to obviously be able to preserve our financial capacity. Um, obviously we have a debt schedule that can be revised to sort of lower some of the debt service to create more operating budget capacity in FY 2021. Um, and likely we will just uh, projects um, and associated uh, borrowing would just be delayed um, so that we could free up that capacity. Um, my approach for FY 2021 will be to um, uh, present a very limited capital uh, projects, and these would only be for critical uh, time sensitive projects, and we would essentially push out any other projects out into future uh, years. Um, so that's going to be our approach because obviously, given the uncertainty of our um, operating uh, budget um, and the ability to fund capital either through cash capital or to cover expanded debt service from the budget, um, it seems prudent that we um, use implement a very austere approach to capital um, improvements uh, for fiscal year 2021. Next slide. So the fiscal uh, 2021 budget, again, as I mentioned, it's uh, it, it is uh, due to you in 75 days. Now here's a here's an old chestnut slide that I showed many times at town hall meetings in recent months, um, where we talked about our efforts to rebuild our um, stabilization funds. Um, and I often pointed out that after the Great Recession, our stabilization funds were had diminished down to a little over four thousand um, dollars, and that we've worked really hard to rebuild them over time. Obviously, I got a lot of questions and a lot of concern during those um, uh, town hall meetings about the size of our uh, stabilization funds and the percentages we were using. Um, and as I tried to express um, at the time, the purpose of these uh, funds are for uh, the types of unforeseen emergencies and crises that unfortunately we find ourselves in now, uh, particularly in the middle of, a, of an economic crisis and a recession and the potential deep loss of local revenues and potential uh, deep cuts to state revenues. So the current status of our, of our stabilization funds, the fiscal stability stabilization fund is at 2.9 million, uh, the capital stabilization fund is at 3.8 million, and we have 5.1 um, in our stabilization fund. So obviously those will be um, things that we will be looking at as we look to build budgets um, out into the future as ways to try to potentially lessen um, some of the pain. Obviously, we don't want to overly rely on them because we want to make them last. Um, and we also uh, don't want, to, we know that when, if you use a lot and then there's no more left, then you're faced with even deeper cuts. So, um, so you know, our, 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 our prudence in making sure that we rebuilt our funds after the last recession um, 
unfortunately have paid off. I, I had hoped that we would not have to, to face this type of situation, but this sort of illustrates in real time why these stabilization funds are critical. So we'll be looking at, uh, at those as ways to help um, support parts of our budget going forward potentially. Next slide. So uh, now just looking ahead to the first quarter, and again, this is just looking ahead to the first quarter of FY 2021 and the potential impacts. And again, we turn to um, looking at many of these local, uh, local revenues and again, paying attention to the dates in question. So the first quarter revenues for uh, hotel, motel, meals, and adult use marijuana are actually for May, June, and July. Um, so literally, uh, you know, for hotel, motel, uh, May, June, and July are probably our biggest months in terms of uh, revenue. Obviously, commencement uh, for the five college commencement season um, and the start of summer are some of the biggest months um, of the year. And, and hoteliers will tell you that uh, it's those months that help sustain them and even out the rest of the year. So uh, we're looking, unfortunately, if the current crisis continues and our hotels are essentially shuttered right now, um, that we're looking at significant reductions in revenues there. Um, we, we're making some projections about, um, our, about lost revenue in the other two categories, um, parking, parking tickets, um, recreation revenues, which obviously provide a certain percentage of revenues to the general fund. Um, you know, spring sports are obviously not going to be happening. It's unclear whether camps will be happening or be allowed to happen. Um, continuing the ambulance revenue, um, we, if there's no change and that stays on course, we could see uh, you know, another $300,000 um, uh, of lost revenue in ambulance. Um, and then continuing on uh, permits, uh, building, wiring, et cetera. Um, Medicaid from schools, that's a reimbursement program um, that may or may not be um, uh, uh, available. And then obviously interest on investments, um, interest rates are uh, quite low right now. So we, we are, and seem to be dropping. So we probably will see lower invest, uh, interest on the monies that we have um, in, in savings and investments. So right now, uh, looking, you know, where we sit right now, we are looking at a potential estimated loss revenue for the first quarter. Again, this is just the first quarter of 2021 of about $1.5 million um, of what we had been, uh, what we had been projecting as we were looking ahead to FY 2021. And again, that's just local revenue. When you look at reductions in state aid, um, that's a whole other piece of this that we really don't have any clear uh, numbers on. You know, we can we can we can apply some of the you know the Mass Taxpayers uh, Foundation uh, number of you know fourteen uh, percent drop um, and think about you know what that might do to our local revenues. And again, that could be for the year could be an additional you know one and a half to two million dollar uh, drop in revenues um, from state government. So. Um, serious uh, loss of revenue. And again, that's just the first quarter, um, depending on how long this crisis continues um, and, uh, and how long some of these sectors of the economy are closed or um, even when they're reopened, um, how much time it will take um, uh, for them to rebound and rebuild and, uh, and what businesses may not reopen and be lost as part of uh, as part of this uh, shutdown. So these are some of the, the things that we're thinking about as we try to build a 2021 budget. Next slide. So expenditures. Obviously, we will be um, looking to uh, very carefully at the 2021 budget and fully expecting that we are going to have to make significant uh, reductions to account for those lost revenues. Um, and so um, again, and, and also keeping in mind that we will most likely uh, be continuing to incur ongoing COVID-19 um, expenses uh, potentially you know, into, into uh, July and August um, that may still need to happen as we move out of this. Um, we will also need to be looking at uh, reductions or eliminations of some services or programs and departments um, will likely mean we will not fill vacant positions 
We may need to do staff reductions um, across the general fund uh, since 73% of the general fund budget is salaries. Um, uh, there, may, there, there would be a corresponding reduction in employee benefits um, as part of those staff reductions. Um, so that would also create some savings. Um, the Northampton Public Schools, um, uh, we just adopted our budget for FY 2021 on Monday um, and the superintendent, um, I think very prudently um, uh, during the middle of their budget process when the COVID-19 emergency uh, struck, uh, made some significant changes uh, to their budget and actually revised it downward in terms of the size of um, the budget and what was being uh, what was being proposed, knowing that the city uh, was going to be facing these challenges. Um, and again, those are those are um, a, a downward revision that again was made with. Um, information that we know now, we don't know what's going to happen with state aid and with education aid. Um, there's talk about whether or not the Student Opportunity Act will actually be implemented or not. Um, and so, um, so obviously we may see some reductions in our schools. Um, we may need to cut back on our annual contribution to the stabilization fund and the cash capital uh, projects. And obviously we talked about the debt service reduction. So these are some of the things that we're gonna be looking at very carefully as we try to build the 2021 budget. Um, but um, when you look at those revenue uh, reductions uh, uh, at a you know 1.5 million a quarter just in local revenue, uh, that is significant. And, uh, and so we need to be prepared to make, um, take significant steps in building the FY 2021 budget uh, to be able to balance the budget. So next slide. So the other thing that, um, that I want to talk about or announce is the fact that, uh, as we know, uh, March 3rd, 2020, uh, the voters adopted the Proposition 2.5 override, um, authorizing us to raise an additional $2.5 million in revenue uh, to support city and school services for the fiscal year that was to begin the beginning July 1st, 2020. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one week later on March 10th, uh, Governor Baker declared a state of emergency, um, and that public health crisis has created massive economic disruption, record unemployment, um, and an almost certain recession. Um, so given the uncertain duration of the COVID-19 crisis and the severe economic stress facing Northampton residents, including many who are now furloughed or laid off from jobs, we have local businesses that have been forced to close because of the shutdown. I feel that we cannot in good conscience implement a voter authorized property inc tax increase in just over two months. So my plan is to submit a proposed FY 2021 budget that would forgo, forgo the use of that 2.5 million in additional revenue. And I would delay implementation of the override until FY 2022. Uh, that begins on July 1st of 2021. Um, so we would need to uh, uh, revise our plans and our estimates and the multi-year plans uh, that we made. Um, again, uh, we are in the middle of a public health crisis. Many people are out of work. Uh, many people are experiencing severe financial uh, distress. Um, and so to uh, move forward at this time uh, does not uh, does not seem like the right thing for us to be doing. So I am going to delay it and um, and bring it um, and not bring that additional revenue online for one year on July 1st of 2021. So that is a very quick overview of what is going to be a very long and uh, complicated uh, next several weeks between now and May 15th um, as we try to uh, uh, first of all, keep a close eye on the FY 2020 budget, um, but also uh, uh, try to craft uh, an FY 2021 budget uh, that anticipates uh, this recession that we're in and the severe impact that we'll be experiencing in both local and potentially state revenue. So that is my presentation and I'll open it up to questions. Thank you very much, Mayor Narkowitz. I'm not at all sure how amidst all of this, your office was able to put together 
such a, a detailed and extensive presentation, but we certainly thank you for it. Well, um, uh, Susan Wright um, uh, can is is uh, you know we've been Zoom conferencing all week and reviewing drafts, and so thank you to Susan obviously who's been helping pull together these numbers and these estimates um, and incorporating all the information. So uh, yes, it, it was. Um, it was a uh, PowerPoint by Zoom conference, so. <laughs> well, thank you, and thank you, Susan. Um, and it uh, it was as concerning a presentation as I, uh, I feared it would be. Um, so I know that there are a lot of questions. I have uh, some myself, but I will um, let the other counselors ask first. They'll probably get to my question as well. I, um, First up, I see Councillor Thorpe, then Councillor DeBarge, and then I know that Councillor Dwight. Thank you. And thank you, Mayor, for making that presentation. Uh, you already answered one of the questions I was going to ask, and that we are dealing, uh, the city is dealing with uh, increased expenditures. But I also would like to uh, thank you for um, notifying everyone, especially those who are watching, about the delayed implementation that you're considering of the Prop 2.5 override. And I've heard from constituents who were concerned, who were laid off about how's this gonna impact them. And I appreciate you mentioning this tonight. And that's all I really have to say for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, it was Councillor LaBarge and then Councillor Dwight. Thank you, Councillor Shearer. Um, Mayor, I wanna thank you for this very thorough presentation and Susan Wright also. And I know because I had emailed the mayor, which Councillor Shearer knows, of the great concerns that I've had from people with emails and calling me on my phone about how they're laid off, they depend on two paychecks in order to pay their mortgages and so forth, and the food on the table for their children, and about the prop proposition two and a half if for some reason that we could have a moratorium placed on the Prop 2 and a half. And this is dreadful here of what's happening. And to see that our mayor in Susan has put in a very thorough, thorough budget here is that hopefully within that year, with not having that Prop 2 and a half, many people will be, be able to go back to work and get back on their feet because I can't tell you how bad it is in this city right now. I mean, people talking to me, losing their jobs and families, it's awful. But thank you both, Mayor and Susan, for the excellent presentation and all the work that you have done to present this tonight. Thank you, Councillor Dwight and Councillor Nash. Um, Your Honor, I'm, I'm not the least bit surprised uh, in your very thorough and anticipatory, um, <laughs> the, the way you and your staff have anticipated uh, how to proceed in this crisis as it changes moment to moment. But I'm also, I, I think it's in keeping with everything else that you've done, uh, you, you have actually uh, I, I'm impressed beyond a proper way to express it. So I do have a question relative to um, the uh, uh, moratorium, as it were. What are the protocols? I'm not sure. I mean, I, you know, this is unprecedented. And I, uh, you as in the executive, you're, uh, you have the authority to actually uh, declare essentially a deferment on a, on, a, on, a, on a voter initiative and also does it require anything of the council ultimately? So um, that's a good question and I know um, I, I, I know I had a conversation some communication with Councillor Jared about that as well. Am I did I unmute sometimes I don't know nope, sorry about that. Nope, um, so um, in, we've, we've, we've checked with the Department of Revenue and their legal department, so essentially, you know, when when the voters granted us this authority to raise this additional 2.5 million, um, they gave us the authority to do that, um, and so they basically raised our overall tax levy. Um, and so we, um, but but they gave us the authority 
um, but they do not, that does not mean that um, in any given year when you um, um, file a budget that you have to use your full tax levy capacity. So um, we've run this by them um, and that's a fair, that's a, that's a sort of um, an authority as part of local municipal uh, budget authority um, that we are able to utilize. And so I'm, I'm not saying that I'm wiping away the election result because the election result passed and in the eyes of the Department of Revenue, we have an additional 2.5 million in uh, revenue levy capacity. What I'm saying is that as mayor, um, I'm going to submit a budget that doesn't fully, that doesn't utilize that additional 2.5 million um, in this fiscal year. I will not do that until the next fiscal year. Um, so again, they've, the additional revenue is authorized. Uh, we are not going to, essentially we're not going to tap it until July 1st of 2021. So that, that's, and so the budget process, so the council obviously would be approving a budget um, that would, uh, that would, you know, that would not have that additional 2.5 million in revenue um, as part of it. Um, we would, th th we would still have that 2.5 million. Um, you may have heard people say it's there forever um, in terms of uh, levy capacity. Um, so it is there. And so we would not tap it until next year. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Nash. Thank you. Um, so, Mayor, I, you know, I, I remember stopping by your office on March 4th and um, to ask a question and your door was closed and, and the word from the staff in your office is, the mayor is meeting all day with administrators to plan the budget. That's the day after the override. And you were in the process of implementing, at that point, you didn't know if you're gonna have an override or not. And you finally got the word go from the voters on March 3rd. And, and you had a week where you were implementing that budget. And then a week later, you knew you were gonna to have to redo that budget. And the, the uh, I, I, I have to say, I'm so impressed with the assessment that uh, you and finance director Wright were able to pull together for us tonight. I, I was expecting basically the you know, uh, dire uh, finance director to share the quarterly reports and you know, it's looking bad. I, I did, um, this level of detail is, is super impressive. So I, I wanna thank you for that. And, um, and that I, it's amazing how nimble you guys have been to be able to pull this together um, on, in this crisis. And um, so I, I wanna thank you. Um, yes, I, 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 want, just, I, I just, I do wanna say though, I just, when you say in this detail, I, I just, I tried to preface this. These are our, these are our best estimates right now. Oh, I, like, I get that. There are some things we know, like we know revenue shortfalls that are happening in 2020. Um, but these are still just estimates from us. Um, right. And that's, you know, that's what a budget is in many ways. But so I, I just want to caution people that, you know, these numbers may change. The House may announce something next week. Um, uh, there may be some new federal money. But um, so I just want to, I, that's the only cautionary thing about putting numbers on a page. But, but, but I appreciate that. And I will say that we have, um, we've been having Zoom depart, uh, departmental budget meetings all week. Um, with um, uh, all the various department heads to basically go back um, and say, okay, this is the budget we were talking about, um, you know, beginning in December, January, February. Um, now we need to go back and, and look at some other scenarios um, and where can we cut and where are possible ways that we could reduce it. So we are, even in this environment, we're having those departmental budget meetings. Thank you. And yes, I realized that there's a lot of, moving parts here, but that that you guys have have your eyes on those things. I, I really appreciate that. Um, Thank you. I also appreciate that um, that the, the work we've done around uh, building the reserve funds over the, you know, over the last 10 years, that they're there for us now to help us weather this crisis. And I agree with you that this is this is a time to this is what they're there for. And we need to be frugal with them, but 
I, I, I really appreciate all of the work that we've done to build that up. Um, so I have two questions and you may or may not know the answer. Uh, one has to do, I, I don't know where the bonding for North Farms Road uh, reconstruction stands. Is that being put off for a year? Um, we, um, we had already approved that, I think back in the previous council. I, do you know where that stands or is that a detail? Um, I think our, our plan had been um, because of the timing of that project, and I'll have this, the finance director talk about it. I think our plan had been to not do that bonding until, um, until uh, the fall, but I'll let the finance director uh, tell me if that's still the thinking or not. Yeah, the um, the 1.5 million that we uh, that council authorized in October, um, the DPW director will not be actually incurring any expenses related that to that until July. So our plan changed, and we decided to bond next spring for that. And our first debt payment on that will be due in FY22 instead of FY21. Thank you. So the design work is moving forward on that project, and we're trying to figure out how how the heck it could be bid in this environment. Um, so we're they're still working on that. Um, so that that project could potentially go forward, um, but we wouldn't actually have to go out to bond till uh, till next year on it. And and thank you. And my last question has to do with something that's outside of our budget that has to do with. Uh, the rebuild of exit 19 in Damon Road, um, and that you may not know the answer tonight, but I'll be, um, since one of those projects is in my ward and the other one abuts it, I, I'm going to be really interested in how those two are going to be funded as we move forward through this, um, this crisis. Yeah, I mean, those, those, um, those projects um, have, um, have already money locked into them as part of the, the transportation improvement program um, that's already been authorized. Um, you've obviously, we've got an order tonight for some final easements um, for Damon Road. Um, the state is still pl is planning to put Damon Road out to bid in May, um, which is part of the reason why we need these easements, uh, um, these final easements that we're accepting for the railroad uh, uh, in two readings. Um, and King Street is planning to go out to bid in June. Um, that's the timetable that the state is under. Um, and then um, we're, there's, they're even moving forward with North King Street and Hatfield. So at least at the state level, these projects are going to continue. Um, obviously, they've had to adapt their, their uh, practices uh, to maintain safety. But you know, outdoor construction of this kind, it seems like that um, will continue. And the state is still on track to get those projects out. So um, that's, that's what I know at this point. Thank you. Okay, I've got uh, Councillor Quinlan, then Councillor LaBarge, I see you. So Councillor Quinlan, then Councillor LaBarge, then Councillor Mayori. So Councillor Quinlan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mayor and Susan, uh, for the uh, uh, honest and sobering look at our city budget with a realistic eye towards the future. Um, I want to mention that I think your uh, delay of the implementation of the override plus talking about tapping into the uh, stabilization funds uh, shows a real compassion for the city people in need. Uh, and I think, it, to be completely frank with you, I think that's why the override passed because people appreciate the fact that you look at it realistically and with compassion for the residents. So I, I congratulate you on that and I thank you for it. Um, I also would like to echo what Councillor Nash said that I'd love to just make sure that because a lot of the projects that we're discussing here, road work that's coming up is in Ward 1. Uh, so I'd love to make sure that I've kept abreast of those projects as well as they're, you know, either moving forward or delaying, however, uh, whatever the cases may be. And then I had two questions. Um, one is I realize it's not part of the general fund, but I'm wondering about the host community funds at the adult use marijuana with them being cl closed right now. Uh, do these months get added to the end of the 60 months or do we, are we just getting 3% of zero at this point? Yeah, that's a really interesting concept. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the law says that it's, um, you know, that it's five years from the start of operation commencement. Right. Um, 
I'm sure the Cannabis Commission will be looking at that. Um, obviously, they don't have revenue coming in, so it's you're right, it's three percent of nothing. Um, that'll have to be, I guess, an interpretation that the the uh, CCC will have to provide as to whether you know those this time period goes into some kind of a stasis and that we then resume. Um, obviously, medical is still uh, moving forward, and there's yeah. no tax revenue, but we do have a small host agreement with them on, on medical, although that's coming close to an end because we're almost hard to believe um, entering our fifth year of having medical right. uh, marijuana. So yeah, so that's one of the many, um, I guess, unanswered question that we'll have to find out about um, in, in the days and months ahead. And then the other question that I had was, uh, as, as we see these projections um, and in the state that the city's in, in, in terms of, of, of office being closed, people working from home, have we, have we laid anyone off? Have we furloughed any city employees at this point? We have not. We have not. Um, we, have, um, we have taken the position and the schools have taken the position. And obviously, we've had conversations with our uh, uh, collective bargaining units about this that, um, you know, the, the budget uh, that, that we, we understand that our employees are in the middle of the same crisis and um, we are working and many of them are working. They're just working remotely um, and, um, and in some ways figuring or, or being reassigned to other tasks um, or, um, you know, finding other ways that they can serve um, their constituency. I just, I think this week, the Arts Council uh, uh, basically took a vote to, to basically turn their grant funds into an emergency fund for artists and to try to help support artists who are largely self-employed. Um, our senior services are doing uh, a lot of outreach work. Our rec department is trying to help people not go insane and, and find ways to recreate um, given the fact that there's no camps, there's no leagues, there's none of those things. So, um, so yeah, we haven't had any and, and so at least through the end of uh, fiscal um, 20, um, although again, as we look at these revenues start to drop off, um, there may be cases where we put a, where we uh, freeze hiring um, in some cases and look at positions that are vacant that may end up being eliminated going forward. And there may have to be eliminations in FY 2021. Um, but obviously, so right now, um, right now, uh, all of our employees are continuing to uh, be paid, um, but that will all have to be reassessed in this new environment as we move into 2021. Sure, uh, thank you very much. Hey, Count Councillor Labarge. Thank you, Councillor Shira. Um, Mayor, I should have asked this before, which is important to me, and I would assume Councillor Shira also being on the committee for the CDBG interviewing and reading on your presentation that I think it stated 35% of cities might not be getting funded. Have Is our city going to be affected with that? Um, I guess I'm, I'm not quite sure of the reference there. Um, so it said on the Oh, this was um, this was in the um, MMA slides, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think that was basically a reference to the fact that there is a there's a large cohort of cities that don't get CDBG funding. So, like um, even locally, West Springfield does not receive CDBG funding. So, um, so I think that was what the reference was to that the fact that even though CDBG this new CDBG money is going out there. If you're a community that doesn't already receive CDBG money, you're not going to get any. So I think that's what the reference was to. So you know, Northampton did receive an, uh, an, ex an extra allotment under the CDBG CARES uh, federal allotment. Um, that was, I think, referring to communities that don't receive CDBG already. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, Councillor Mayori. Yeah. So thank you, Mayor. I um, I was having this vision when you were talking of somewhat building a beautiful sandcastle and then someone just coming and just destroying it. And then you immediately start just building a new one. And I, I appreciate your tenacity. I think that's a, you know such a sign of great leadership. Um, I appreciate that. And I think we all know these are estimates. And even if it's just 
kind of breaking breaking it to us slowly. Um, and we know that can change or maybe there'll be some pleasant surprises, but uh, I really appreciate your responsiveness and groundedness. Um, I just wanted to, and also I just really wanna say that I think we're, we're you know, I, personally, I always knew kind of the importance of a stabilization fund, but I, I don't think any of us were, are ever gonna really forget after this experience, how that can really play out and how that can make the difference in a municipality in terms of surviving. Um, just a minor question. And I had a question for rep resident. Um, I'm confirming that the tax relief um, for seniors uh, program that we expanded is in play and active now. Um, so that actually um, was going into effect July 1st. July 1st. Um, okay. So yeah, so we were implementing that July 1st. There was an extension of um, as part of the governor's uh, bill that he filed, uh, that, that was passed, that allowed me to extend all of the various deadlines for property taxes, et cetera. Um, I, I believe that did also extend the deadline for filing for exemptions. Um, that includes some of the seats, which you typically oh. are due in April. Those got extended into the same, I think, June 1st. Um, give me a nod, Susan, if that's right. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Um, and that was all part of that big uh, press release. I don't know how many press releases ago where we listed the different dates and how they've been extended. Those are also on the COVID-19 page. They're also on the treasurer collectors page, but the new limits um, went in, are, were going into effect on July 1st as well. Um, okay. okay. And those were voted on by the city council. So um, those are not, um, those would, are not being delayed. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions for Mayor Narkowitz? So, and, and again, uh, this is the time that Susan Wright would, uh, this meeting, she would typically present the third quarters and you have them, but you know, as you saw in the presentation, the, the you know, the, the COVID-19 impacts are really, you don't really see a much of it happening on any of those third quarters. It's gonna be the fourth quarter uh, report or the end of year fourth quarter is where we're gonna see the big impact. So, but but Susan's available to go through them as, as well or point out, uh, answer questions about them. Um, okay, so uh, counselors, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at those reports um, and if you have some questions for Susan. Um, or, or if you want, I don't know if Susan wants to just give a quick overview. I mean, there, there's really not a whole lot to um, tell you. Um, as the mayor said, the third quarter is somewhat um, shielded from impact, um, except for parking and a few the other things we put on that slide. I think the uh, difference in the percentage of revenues received this third quarter versus last year at this time is mostly a timing issue. Um, a lot of revenues um, get booked every month and because staff vacated their offices in the first week or so was really spent trying to figure out how to do these functions remotely. Um, a lot of things didn't get put into the accounting system. So some of the revenues that you see there um, are not fully what we actually received in this quarter. So. In general, there's really nothing remarkable. The, the um, enterprise funds are um, doing quite well. Uh, all of the, they have met all of their revenue targets. Um, the general fund, as, a, as the mayor pointed out, is slightly below, but I think that's partially a timing issue and some of it's the majorly the parking um, because we lost two weeks of parking revenue. Um, in terms of expenditures, uh, there are, um, Again, the um, payroll impacts of the COVID-19 uh, emergency haven't really hit in the third quarter. Most of that will hit in the fourth quarter. So in terms of the financials, there's really nothing remarkable to point out to you. Um, and we'll have a much more robust discussion when the fourth quarter comes out. Okay, thank you. Um, any, any questions or comments for Susan on on that. Okay, seeing none, we will move to, um, again, thank you both so much for those, for those really quite remarkable updates. Um, we're gonna move to the next 
uh, item on the agenda, which are the financial orders. So first up, we have 20.041, an order to authorize acceptance of easements from MassDOT for Damon Road reconstruction. Um, and uh, the DPW director has respectfully requested two readings on this um, to stay with the state construction schedule. Um, so I'm gonna read it. Uh, upon the recommendation of, of the mayor and the Department of Public Works, um, ordered that whereas Damon Road and Bridge Road are public ways in and for the city of Northampton, and whereas Damon Road and Bridge Road are in need of reconstruction and the city in conjunction with the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, MassDOT, um, is undertaking the construction and widening of the ways, including drainage improvements and slope stabilization from Bridge Street, Route 9, to the easterly se section of Bridge Road, west of King Street, Routes 5 and 10, and um, quotes the project, and whereas the reconstruction of Damon Road from Route 9 to Route 5 is currently programmed on the 2020 Pioneer Valley Regional Region Transportation Improvement Program, TIP, at the total cost of 10 million $43,653 with $8,034,922 in federal transportation funds reserved to fund the project with the city of Northampton responsible for the costs of the right-of-way acquisition and any water and sewer utility improvements. And whereas in order to proceed with the project, the city needs to acquire one permanent fee interest, two permanent easements, uh, three permanent utility easements, and four temporary construction easements the land acquisitions. And whereas the project and the land acquisitions are shown on the plan entitled, quote, alteration plan of Damon Road and Bridge Road prepared for the city of Northampton, end quote, which is the plan, dated February 28, 2019, and signed and sealed by Jeffrey P. Bradford, PLS, dated April 12, 2019. And whereas on May 16, 2019, the Northampton City Council passed on second reading authorization to acquire all parcels needed to be acquired for the project with the exception of the railroad land owned and controlled by the mass dot which the city cannot acquire absent agreement of mass dot and whereas mass dot has agreed to transfer an easement to the city for nominal consideration on the terms and conditions set forth in an instrument entitled easement agreement and whereas the city council must approve the acquisition in order to accept the easement from mass dot now therefore it be ordered that the city council authorizes the acquisition of purchase gift, eminent domain, or otherwise of three permanent easements and one temporary construction easement for the purposes of widening and reconstructing Damon Road as shown on the plan and on the terms and conditions set forth in the proposed easement agreement. No appropriation is needed for this acquisition because the easement is to be conveyed for nominal consideration. So that is the order. I am looking for a motion from someone in finance. Make make a motion to approve the order. And a second. Okay, okay it's been made by Councillor Quinlan and seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Um, any uh, discussion on this order? I can I can speak to it briefly. Um, just again, you saw the chronology, and then we brought forward several of these orders. Um, we brought forward um, the council approved the um, the previous easements uh, that were mostly from private property owners along Damon Road. Um, this just happens to be an easement that we're getting from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, more specifically the Rail Division of uh, Mass DOT. Um, and so these are the final little slivers. Um, one is temporary, three are permanent um, that will allow for the reconstruction of uh, Damon Road to move forward. Um, Damon, which I mentioned, the state hopes to put out to bid in May. Um, and so this required an agreement between the city um, and, uh, and, um, and the Commonwealth. And, uh, and, now it and now it requires this vote to accept these easements. Um, to allow the project to move forward. There's no cost, there's no consideration. Um, they're being given to us for nominal consideration, which basically means free. Um, and it's just to allow the project to move forward. Okay, thank you. Councilors, any questions? 
Okay, seeing none. Laura, um, roll call please on a positive recommendation on this order from finance. Got it. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. Okay, next up, we have uh, 20.042 in order to authorize intermunicipal agreement with towns for public health nursing programs this is upon the recommendation of the mayor. Um, ordered that whereas Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 4A allows for joint operation of public activities among governmental units, and whereas Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 40A, 4A requires that such intergovernmental agreements be approved in a city by the city council and the mayor, and whereas the city of Northampton provides services to and shares services with other municipalities. Therefore, pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 4A, the City Council hereby authorizes the City of Northampton to enter into the following intermunicipal agreement for FY 2020 and FY 2021. Public Health Nursing Program, contract to partner with the following communities to provide assistance with infectious disease surveillance reporting through the Massachusetts Virtual Epidemiolo Epidemiolo Epidemiologic Network, MAVEN, for the COVID-19 crisis. Middlefield, Chesterfield, Huntington, Plainfield, Worthington, East Hampton, East Longmeadow, and the Foothills Health District, which serves the towns of Waitley, West Hampton, Williamsburg, and Goshen. So that's the order. I'm looking for a motion. Make a motion. Second. The motion's been made by Councillor Barge and seconded by Councillor Thorpe for a positive recommendation. Um, Discussion. I don't have much to don't have much to add other than this is what uh, Meredith O'Leary was discussing earlier this evening. This is the this is the uh, regional collaboration that's being funded by DPH um, that they're doing the contact case investigations. Right, thank you, Councillor Quinlan. Well, I I just was curious to see East Long Meadow in the, the uh, group, whereas all the uh, other towns and communities that are involved are are basically close to us and smaller. Uh, communities around us and then East Long Meadow, uh, it's kind of a, an odd fit. I just was curious about how they came into this. I think my understanding is the call was put out to communities that, that were interested in pursuing this. And um, there are many communities that don't have a full-time public health nurse. So I think they wanted to avail themselves. The work is done. Um, it's, it's, it's done basically on a computer and with a phone. It's, uh, it can happen anywhere and you're basically doing um, follow-up phone calls and contacting uh, people and contacting the people that they've been in contact with. Um, right. So I guess it can, you know, and again, you were talking earlier about the state possibly taking this over at some point, and that would probably be the same thing. It would be done by some centralized location. So, yeah, so I guess it was just a matter of a call went out and East Long Meadow uh, was willing to participate. Um, and so they're using part of their grant uh, that they were eligible for. Basically, we're bundling a bunch of these grants um, to try to build an economy of scale of, um, you know, because what a lot of the smaller towns got wasn't enough to hire a nurse, but by pooling our resources, sure. we could hire four nurses to be able to do this work for all the communities. That's great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Seeing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor <laughs> Quinlan. Yes. Okay, that moves forward with a positive recommendation. Moving on to uh, 20.043, an order to appropriate free cash to Northampton Public Schools for federal foster care transportation reimbursement. Upon the recommendation of the mayor ordered that $4,248 be appropriated from the FY20 general fund undesignated fund balance to Northampton Public Schools for federal foster care transportation reimbursement. I was trying to, trying to share my screen. So this is, um, this is the, uh, one of the grant programs that, um, that I often come to you that the schools um, 
uh, receive the grant monies, but it comes to the city um, as a revenue, and we basically appropriate it back to them out of free cash. Um, and this is a program I think we've discussed previously. Uh, you actually, I think, took a vote authorizing um, the schools to enter into the program uh, to provide foster care, transportation, similar to the uh, transportation we provide for homeless transportation. So this is actually passing back to uh, Northampton Public Schools um, their reimbursement. Okay, thank you. Uh, counselors, I need a motion and a second on this. Make a motion. Make a motion. Motion's been made by Councilor Barge, seconded by Councilor Thorpe, second. I believe. Um, any questions or discussion? Okay. Seeing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. That moves forward with a positive recommendation. Next, we have uh, 20.044, an order to authorize intermunicipal agreement with MEMA during COVID emergency upon the recommendation of the mayor. Whereas a sudden, generally unexpected occurrence of circumstances demanding public action has arisen within the world, county, country, state, and city of Northampton due to the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic and other illnesses, uh, <coughs> here forth as the pandemic. And whereas the president of the United States has declared a national emergency due to the pandemic. And whereas on March 10th, 2020, the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts declared a state of emergency in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts due to the pandemic. And whereas on March 16th, 2020, the mayor of the city of Northampton declared a state of emergency in the city of Northampton due to the pandemic. And whereas on March 20th, 2020, the Northampton Board of Health declared a state of emergency in the city of Northampton due to the pandemic. And whereas in response to the pandemic, the Commonwealth through the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency has contracted for isolation and quarantine housing at the Quality Inn and Suites at 117 Conn Street in Northampton. And whereas the city has agreed to provide support to the site through the Northampton Police Department and the Commonwealth has agreed to reimburse the city for certain expenses associated with that police support. And whereas the Commonwealth proposes to memorialize the agreement in a memorandum of agreement entitled Memorandum of Understanding between the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the City of Northampton, <laughs> dated April, we don't know yet, 2020. And whereas in accordance with the Mass General Laws 40, subsection 4A, the approval of the City Council is required in order for the City to enter into an agreement to perform joint services with a state agency. Now, therefore, therefore be it ordered in accordance with Mass General Law uh, Chapter 40, subsection 4A, the Northampton City Council approves the agreement between the City of Northampton and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts entitled Memorandum, Memorandum of Understanding between the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the City of Northampton dated April uh, 2020 for provision of security support for isolation and quarantine housing at the Quality Inn and Suites, 117 Con Street, and for reimbursement by the Commonwealth for certain expenses associated therewith. I make a motion to uh, move that forward with a positive recommendation. Second. Motion's been made by Councillor Quinlan, seconded by Councillor Labarge. I don't know if this was on the agenda request or not, but this would be one we would also seek two readings on. And um, and the date the dates would be today's date, because literally, um, if you pass it on two readings, I'm going to sign it and, and email it to Mima um, straight away. So basically you heard a little bit of this from Meredith O'Leary, but one of the challenges that we've had when we were um, standing up the shelter um, at the high school was obviously trying to keep that a healthy shelter um, and screening people very, very diligently um, and trying to isolate and quarantine and get tested um, uh, those um, homeless residents who um, showed any symptoms or were running a fever. Um, but we needed a place to put them. And so we were, um, uh, I was in communication with the owner of, um, of the Quality Inn and some several other uh, local um, hotels and motels. Um, and we were, um, we were having some of those folks stay there, but there were also have been conversations on a statewide level about this gap um, and the need for uh, what the state calls um, um, isolation and recovery sites that they've stood up in Berkshire County and, and, in, um, and in Lexington, Massachusetts, that we really needed something like this in Hampshire County 
I've been talking very closely with town manager Bockelman in Amherst. Um, both Amherst and Northampton are keeping, are trying to maintain their shelters. Uh, Craig's Doors is still operating, but then what do we do when we have um, people that um, show symptoms that can't stay um, in this type of congregate housing? So um, there have been conversations going on for the last several weeks, and I've uh, we've been on a series of conference calls uh, together uh, and singularly with MEMA um, about their um, standing up one of these quarantine and isolation sites. Um, for a while, there was a hotel in, in um, Hadley that had been identified uh, that got close to the finish line and fell through. Um, and then we came back to the Quality Inn and we actually had a conference call um, on sat this Saturday uh, with the director of MEMA, um, and uh, and we ironed out the final details of them actually. So they're basically renting the entire hotel, um, and it'll be a um, an isolation and recovery resource, not just for Northampton but for Hampshire County. So if somebody at Craig's Doors is symptomatic, they'll have a place to go. Um, and again, this comes uh, MEMA will be staffing the hotel. There will be medical personnel. Um, the one piece that MEMA asked if Northampton would provide is security. Um, and so in the, in just in the form of having a police presence that could be there to just monitor the site um, and, um, and do external security. Um, and so we agreed uh, that we would do that. Uh, Chief, Caf Chief Casper um, agreed that she would be able to detail an officer there. We will be fully reimbursed, uh, not just the 75%. Um, FEMA reimbursement, but MEMA will also pay the remaining 25% match um, to provide this service. They find it's easier in, where they've set these up to have local law enforcement who know the community rather than bringing in some outside, you know, state police or someone else to provide security. So this, um, this uh, authorizes me to sign this MOU, uh, which is uh, an important final step in uh, this really vital uh, resource that MEMA will be funding. The other great thing is that MEMA will be the one funding it. MEMA will be the one having to apply for federal reimbursement. Um, we've already um, incurred some expenses um, uh, by, by having folks in isolation. Um, and so this will remove this sort of bureaucratic burden from us. Um, and again, it'll be a ready resource um, that, that we'll be able, if, if we do have people that become sick or present at the shelter sick, we'll have a place to safely put them. Um, and again, they'll be provided meals, they'll be provided medical attention. Um, and what Northampton will be providing is just uh, security for the hotel. Because obviously, um, this would be a, a cluster of people with COVID-19. Um, and so it would be very important to, to, to make sure that its access is controlled. Um, uh, so that's what this would authorize. And again, if you could authorize it in two readings, that would be very appreciated. Okay, thank you. Councillor Labarge. Yeah. Um, so what I'm actually hearing, which I had talked with Susan this week in regards to this, which really clarified a lot that I read on this. So Mima is definitely paying for everything. And our police department. Now, because it's coming into Northampton, I mean, they would have had to ask our police department first, correct, Mayor? Um, you know, again, they, they could, they could have had tried to bring in some state resources like the National Guard, or they could have brought in state police. That's, that would have been a possibility. Um, but I think as they described, um, similar to what they've done in Berkshire County and Lexington, um, they've started by asking local police if they would provide it, just because again, local police um, know the area, um, be a very fast response time at that location. Um, and so that's that sort of was the first step and we agreed. And these would not be um, officers that are, you know, patrol officers, these would be a detail officer um, that would be in addition to uh, the regular officers that are on the street. So it won't be taking away from our on the street resources. So in other words, in our police department, we would use reserve officers first, then- No, what I'm saying is that we would, this would be, these would be off duty officers. Okay. So we would not divert on duty officers to go there. 
these would be off-duty officers, similar to, to the, the um, you know, the uh, details that we, that happened at NETA um, and happen, um, actually we have details now you, at the transfer station, um, just because we need help managing the traffic to maintain social distancing. So these would be um, either off-duty regular officers or, or special officers who would, um, who would um, have details. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, seeing none, Laura, roll call, please. Could you please repeat for me who made the motion in second? I was temporarily distracted. I first. Was it uh, Councillor Quinlan? Was I, I did the yes. first. Okay. I think, didn't I? Yes, oh. I did the first. Michael did? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we'll get a chance. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I Councillor Mayori's buzzer. <laughs> Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Thank you. Okay, that moves forward with a positive recommendation. Um, we are up to. 20.046 in order to approve gift fund expenditures for Resilience Hub upon the recommendation of the mayor. Uh, whereas one of the key service gap recommendations of the 2019 mayor's work group on panhandling study report, a downtown Northampton for everyone, residents, visitors, merchants, and people at risk was the creation of a community day center to serve Northampton's at-risk population. And whereas in line with that recommendation and concurrent with Northampton's climate resili resiliency efforts, the city is exploring creation of a resilience hub and day program to support vulnerable residents facing chronic and acute stress due to climate change and other disasters and social and economic challenges. And whereas during normal times, a resilience hub would serve those at the front line of chronic stress i.e. frontline communities, including homeless, single room occupancy, SRO residents, those living in extreme poverty in climate vulnerable populations and possibly other community needs. And whereas the resilience hub will be designed, however, so that during times of acute stress or major disruption, e.g. a major storm event, disaster or pandemic, and during the recovery phase, it can serve all residents. And whereas preliminary communication, commu preliminary community discussions of this resilience hub concept as part of the city's community development block grant CDBG action plan development have created significant interest and already inspired two substantial donations to support the effort. <laughs> Ordered that Northampton City Council in accordance with Massachusetts General Law Chapter 44 Section 53A, grants and gifts, acceptance and expenditure, authorizes the expenditure of funds donated by the public to be used for the ongoing planning and potential implementation of a resilience hub and day program to support Northampton residents who face chronic and acute stress due to climate change and other disasters and social and economic challenges. Motion, please. So move for the motion. Motion's been made by Councillor Thorpe and seconded by? Councillor LaBarge. Councillor LaBarge, thank you very much. Um, Mayor Nerkowitz. Yeah, well, I, we tried to kind of capture it all in the um, in the order itself, but um, but this concept of a, re a resilience hub um, sort of really dovetailed with the need that we had identified um, for, and actually the need that actually was further exposed uh, during this pandemic, where uh, one of the reasons we stood up the shelter was the fact that a we had shelters that were too small. Um, to provide adequate social distancing. But then the other issue was that um, our current shelter model um, is that the shelters close in the morning and everyone has to leave. Um, and so, um, and there's not, a, there's not another resource uh, center um, uh, that people can go during the daytime uh, while waiting for our two shelters, the Cot Shelter and Grove Street to reopen. Um, there are other models already like this, like the Amherst Survival Center. So we were already looking at this and then um, the Resilience Hub, um, uh, which is a, a, a concept that's also related to climate change and, and impacts of climate change dovetailed nicely with it. So um, 
Director Fiden's already been doing some planning, early planning efforts on it and having some early discussions about it. Um, and uh, because of that, we had two people already step forward, intrigued by it and wanting to make gifts to support that. So all we're asking you tonight is not to, not to approve a resilience hub or approve the concept or anything like that, but to allow us to set up a fund um, and expend gifts um, uh, to help um, support the planning, further planning efforts, um, which inevitably uh, Mr. Fiden will continue to seek grants for as we move forward. But these are at least two gifts that have come in and there may be others. So uh, that's all this order is asking you to do to authorize us to accept, well, we can accept the gifts, but we wanna be able to spend them on uh, this Resilience Hub concept. Thank you. That's, um, I'll say that's, you know, that's wonderful. For me, this was one of the recommendations that I was most excited about and was really thrilled to have some conversation around it this year during the CDBG com um, committee discussions. Um, and, you know, right now it, it just feels all the more sort of poignant and necessary as we're all sheltering in our ways. Um, and so news of two substantial donations is, uh, just feels like a nice needed ray of hope and, um, you know, good feeling for the future. So uh, thanks to those donors. Um, uh, Councillor Quinlan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just would, would echo your statements uh, to our president that uh, this is, is really a great positive feeling around the scene that people in the community are, are getting behind this uh, idea that the, that the mayor and, and Mr. Biden are moving forward. And I wonder, uh, how far along is the planning of spending this money or, you know, developing this resilience hub? Uh, you know, I understand we're at the beginning, but is there a location? Is there, uh, you know, how, how, what other plans have been made so far? I know Mr. Fiden right now is really in the early design phase and he's actually put out a call to architects um, who may want to work on this because really um, before looking for a location um, or, or uh, they really have to understand what, what the it is, like what, what, what they're talking about in terms of size, what, would, what types of amenities, what types of, um, even what the layout of such a facility. So I know that right now he's in that phase. Um, and then once um, a concept is developed, then it would be uh, about looking uh, for um, uh, a space and 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 um, and obviously the other key component of this. But again, this is further down the road. Is you know who would operate it, like what who would who would actually run the facility. But but really at this point they're in the early phases, um, and I think they're sort of in the design um, still phase. So I think that's where he's going now. I kind of equate it to. Uh, you know, Mr. Fiden has advanced um, like the small home, uh, tiny home, small lot project uh, where he engaged local architects to come up with some models and some designs um, before eventually putting these out and, 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 um, and actually we're seeing some of them being built. So I think he's still in that in that early uh, preconceptual phase um, and that and these grants will be great because they will support um, some of that early uh, work. Uh, to maybe get it more shaped, shaped so that it would be possibly eligible for further support. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Councillor Labarge. Yes, um, I'm going to support this and I have to echo what Councillor Gina Louise was talking about. There's been a lot of time and effort put in place of making this happen. And it's in dire need. And how can we not say and not approve this? Because I do approve it 100%. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Councillor Mayori. Yeah, I just wanted to say how excited I was to see this on the agenda. I mean, think moving forward, it's not going to, you know, it's we're going to be looking at what we're uh, having to cut back on. But I think in emergencies like oh. this, thinking, thinking about how we can um, you guys froze for a minute. Thinking of, of ways that will help us all recover as a community, whether it comes from our city budget or outside of that, is is, a, is really visionary. And I think those donors saw that. So thank you for this. Um, that moment of whatever I just did, um, you may or may not have heard it, was Mr. Fiden's actually on the call. So um, 
if you wanted to hear from him directly, he's he's on the call. Mr. Fiden, are you there? Sure. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, so just I can give you a very quick detail where we are in the process. So um, we have a committee right now that's 16 or 17 people. Um, about a third of it is uh, city departments. A lot of different city departments would be involved with this from health department to my department to emergency services. Um, so across the board and then a lot of social service providers on the process. Um, so a lot of excitement as you all heard. Um, you can guess in some ways the biggest challenge is right now we're brainstorming what are all the things which we'd like to be there. You heard Meredith O'Leary talk about the day programs that are going on right now at the high school, all those kinds of things which would make sense to be here. Um, and so we're sort of brainstorming and then we need to prioritize those. We are in the process of engaging an architect to help with space planning. Um, it'll be a fairly small study and, and the architect's job is really to say, here's the consequences. We dream, we dream big. Here's all the things we'd like to have. What's the cost of those things? What are the trade-offs so we can start prioritizing those? And so the architect would be helping from planning up to creating a space plan. And only really then can we look for for a building or property, so we know how big a space we need. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments on the Resilience Hub? Okay, seeing none. Roll call, please, Laura, on a positive recommendation. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that moves forward for the positive recommendation. Um, the next item we have is, um, it's a discussion on how to proceed regarding the 2021 audit. I'm gonna read Laura's memo uh, that she sent to the council because I think it really lays this out well. Um, that's not it though, where is it? Uh, the, the first document is. Oh yeah, for some reason, okay, hold on. Too many things open. Okay, here we go. Uh, so this is uh, Laura Kretzler, our administrative assistant wrote this to us um, two days ago. Uh, so as mentioned at the organizational meeting at the committee, as the committee charged with making recommendations on financial matters, the finance committee typically takes the lead in making recommendations on the independent audit. The charter adopted in 2012 assigns the city council the responsibility to annually provide for an outside audit of the city's books and accounts. Scanlon and Associates has been the city's auditor for at least two decades. The first time the city council conducted a full procurement process was in 2015. In September of 2015, as the low bidder, the council awarded a three-year contract to Scanlon Associates for the FY16 to FY18 audits. That contract has been extended twice, so we are now in the fifth year of the contract with Scanlon. Last year, the Finance Committee recommended extending the contract for another year with the understanding that there would be a full procurement process this year. Since there is now a new council and in light of recent events, we wanted to initiate a conversation to see if the Finance Committee's recommendation and the council's will is still to conduct a full procurement process. The charter says, quote, the award of a contract to audit shall be made by the city council on or before September 15th of each year, end quote. So if the, if the finance committee wants to conduct a procurement process this year, it needs to commence very soon in order to meet this deadline. For Mass General Law Chapter 30B, um, contracts with labor relations representatives, lawyers, or certified public uh, accountants are exempt from the State Procurement Act. So going out to bid is not legally required, and the procurement process to be followed is not prescribed by Chapter 30, but is at the discretion of the City Council. While well, going out to bid is not legally required, both the Department of Revenue DOR and the Government Finance Officers Association, GFOA, recommend municipalities undertake a full-scale competitive process for the selection of an independent auditor every five to eight years. And uh, or is it attached that? Um, I prepared two sample timelines for informational purposes. Ideally, accounting firms should be given 30 days to respond to an RFP. And finance committee members have to review the, pro the proposals, decide which firms to interview and conduct interviews. The finance committee's recommendation needs to get to council by its August meeting in order to allow two readings prior to the September 15th deadline. 
The timelines show that the process would need to commence with the issuance of an RFP either May 1st or June 1st at the latest. Um, so that's why we're having this discussion right now. So thank you, Laura, for that memo. Um, so as it said, best the best practice recommendation is to conduct a full procurement process every five to eight years. This will be the sixth year. So we're still well within that five to eight years, um, uh, the recommendation of five to eight years. So um, we did go through a full procurement process in 2015 and um, the three-year contract was awarded as it says to Scanlon. Um, and it's been extended twice. So um, we're having this discussion now. It's not an ideal time. Um, and I'm ever mindful that we're operating in a state of emergency and we're only doing this because Laura has so brilliantly crafted this timeline that dictates that uh, the procurement process would really need to start very soon. So we have um, no option but to really have this conversation at this time. So as I see it, um, the options are that one, we embark on a full procurement process, put on an RFP, interview qualified firms that want to bid, then award a contract. Uh, two, we extend Scanlon's contract for another year. Or three, we award a three-year contract to Scanlon as recommended by the Charter Review Committee. Um, they, didn't, they didn't recommend a specific auditor, but they recommended a three-year contract. Um, which would bring us to eight years, which would be sort of that the, uh, the bounds of that recommendation. Um, and then we would discuss doing the procurement process. So uh, I'll just add that I was one of the counselors that um, advocated for going through the procurement process in 2015. And I still really think that the concept of fresh eyes has merit. Um, Though having gone through that process, which is a pretty extensive process, I learned a lot about the practical realities around achieving those fresh eyes. Um, so, you know, I would say based on that, I would say that my preference for, for proceeding, which I'm just gonna share with you, is that we do not undertake this process at this time during this crisis. Um, while, the RFP process would primarily use Laura's time, a lot of Laura's time, and council time and resources. Um, if I remember correctly from doing this in 2015, it did involve uh, finance director Wright's time quite a bit and some other staff to assist in determining which firms were appropriate or qualified to be considered. Um, there is a lot of technical and sort of specific aspects to the proposals for which we require assistance from someone whose field it is, like Director Wright. Um, so, and then, you know, beyond the, that procurement process, um, and I'm hoping that maybe Susan can speak to this more, uh, switching to a new auditor would be a massive undertaking for many city departments um, and would likely have a budget implication at a time um, which we've, you know, just recently heard is possibly going to be one, or not possibly, is going to be one of financial challenge, if not financial crisis. Um, last time Scanlon was by far the lowest bid and it's uh, unlikely that a firm that would be coming on fresh would, wouldn't have um, a higher bid than Scanlon uh, and most likely a significantly higher um, bid. So, um, so we're opening up this discussion. I see, I see hands already. I just, I took the, um, I, I took advantage of giving you my opinion to start, um, but I'm Councillor Dwight is just waving at me. So, Councillor Dwight, um, I agree absolutely with everything you say. And in fact, I can't say this more emphatically. It would be wholly inappropriate at this point to start that process. And I, I would remind you that the last time we did it, there was only one other mm -hmm. bit. And um, the process did take a long time. It, it should take a long time. It should, it should be given all due consideration. We're starting a little too late in the process for this. I understand the structure and I also understand the circumstances that find us here. But I mean, I, the, uh, to the point that you made about Susan Wright and the whole department is, a, is one of the more cogent ones in this respect because that would put pressures on an agency and a department 
that is under enormous stress right now, and we expect uh, we we expect a great deal from to burden them with the uh, trying to bring another agency up to speed would be uh, would be too onerous. It'd be it'd be inappropriate. Also, to your point about the fact, I want to reiterate that yes, it is the recommendation of the Charter Review Committee to. Um, for, for actually principally for one of these reasons is to extend the contract for three years to allow uh, a longer vetting process over the course of that those three years that we can start considering putting out the bid in, um, in, in you know a year or two in advance. Um, I think that there, there actually, I can see absolutely no upside and a multitude of downsides if we proceed with um, option one. I agree. I think your option three is a good proposal that we um, take the recommendation, even though it is not codified in the charter about the, extending the contract for three years, which would, keep, would still have us conform with best practices. And um, in three years, Lord knows where we'll be, but in three years, have an opportunity to consider possibly another, another firm. But I must say, I also have to say that Scanlon has actually, they have fresh eyes. Each time they do a review, they review different dimensions and aspects uh, more granularly of, of the city's uh, finances and actually do mix it up. And um, they have served us very well. And given the fact that there is not a large queue of people wanting to sign up to do uh, Northampton's municipal audit, um, as I said, just one other agency from Boston, as I recall, uh, applied last time. I, I, I really think that we would do an enormous disservice to the financial department, the mayor, and the and the, the superstructure of the city, and an enormous disservice to the citizens ultimately if we decide to proceed with going right now with uh, 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 putting out the bid for a new auditor that we may or may not get. Um, thank you. Um, so. Uh, I know that there are other hands that are up. Um, counselors, I don't know if you want to speak first or if we want to hear from Susan, who's still here with us. Um, Counselor Jarrett has doubled his hand by putting up a physical hand. Um, okay, let's go to Counselor Jarrett, then we'll go to Counselor Labarge. Um, mine, I, I certainly have thoughts about this, but first, a point of process. I think this is the first time I've seen new business the new business section being used. And I just wanted to clarify in our rules, um, we're, it's to be considered at the next meeting and not to be debated during new business. Is a discussion different than a debate in that we're just discussing it, but we're not gonna make any decisions? I just, so I'd just like some clarity on that. Yeah, thank you. It looks like Laura. I never knew new business had those restrictions on it. So perhaps it, I put it under the wrong subheading. Um, yeah, I probably yeah, would have put, put it. Um, um, I don't know. Maybe a different maybe a category, but just been, so that may have just been an error. OK, um, but it was posted with enough time so that it's appropriate for us to discuss it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Then I would just uh, say that, you know, uh, either extending it a year or um, doing the three years, both of those sound very prudent and not doing it uh, this, uh, not doing it this year sounds very wise. And I agree with the points made by um, both of you, Councillor Dwight and Shara. Thank you. Um, Councillor Labarge. Yes, I'm going to agree with Councillor Shira, what Councillor Bill Dwight was saying, and fair with the finance department with Susan Wright and bringing in another new auditor would be an absolute disaster due to the crisis that we are in. So I'm gonna hopefully agree with all of this. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor Quinlan. Uh, yeah, I basically uh, agree with, with everything that, that each of you have said, uh, everyone that has spoken. Uh, the, the question that I have would be, is there a chance to combine options two and three uh, by extending for this year and then knowing that the terms that this council is under end at the end of next year, looking at putting out an RFP to, to work on over the next 12 months or actually about 14, 15 months uh, for next year. And that would give us the time that Councillor Dwight mentioned to uh, make an educated decision over some time. Um, if I understand what you're saying correctly, so you mean extending for extending the contract for a year and embarking yeah. on that process? Um, yes. Yes, that that would certainly be something we could do. Um, and again, you know, Laura, I don't know if you've looked at Laura's timeline. Laura has like figured this out to the day yeah. as to right. when we need right. to know uh, the steps we need to hit to make it possible. So yes, we could start that. Process. Yeah, for the yeah for this year, yeah, absolutely. But next year would be would be cool. It would yeah that it it um, we could start earlier, but that same timeline would stand for next year as well. Sure. Um. I don't see any other counselors' hands raised. Susan, would you, is there anything you'd like to add to this discussion? Uh, just that, you know, the hiring of the auditor is the city council's decision and um, whatever decision you make, our financial team will rise to that occasion. Um, we do feel very comfortable with uh, Mr. Scanlon and, and I, I do believe he will be the, the least expensive option at least um, for the next year or so just because he has years and years of the background data that an auditor coming in would need to do the work. Um, and there's also a fit, the, the, the weeks that his staff are on site um, take a long time with our staff um, to pull reports and, and provide data. And um, when we go to a new auditor at some point, when the city makes that decision, um, the time involved of the staff will be, will be much increased just in that first year. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, we are very comfortable with him. It's going to be a difficult year, um, but certainly whatever decision the council makes, we will, we will work with it. So thank you. You're welcome. I, uh, I know that you will and would do as remarkable a job with anyone as you do right now. Um, Susan, can I, it, this was, uh, Councillor Dwight and I both sort of brought this up a little bit. Could you just speak super briefly on um, what kind of options there are? You know, uh, this is a leading question, but there are limited there are limited firms that even would make sense or would be willing to bid or be appropriate for to be the auditor of Northampton. Could you just talk um, a little bit to that? There's, you know, there's a number of firms that do municipal auditing. It's kind of a specialty. Um, I believe actually the last time you did this, there were four firms that, um, that bid, um, if I recall, um, but there are very few local firms. And I think that that also um, fa factors into the price factor as well. Um, and having a local firm, um, whatever you do, having a local firm does have some advantages in that they are able to come on site throughout the year when we have unusual situations, like when we're doing a, a bond refunding or, or something. They, they do provide services to our financial team throughout the year. Um, so there aren't a lot of local ones, but um, each firm also has different leads. And I know that Mr. Scanlon often assigns different leads um, to do our audit. So it is, um, you can get fresh eyes on things just by using different, different um, staff members to kind of run the audit process. So, um, but yes, I think if you did put it out to bid, you would get, you would get some interest. There's no question there. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments? Okay, so seeing none, um, Laura, how would you recommend we proceed at this point? Um, so there's not any action needed if, well, if the consensus were to recommend extending it either for one or three years, that vote would have to take place in the fall by the full council. Um, so there's not really any action that would 
necessarily be needed at this time unless the finance committee wants to like formalize their decision in the form of a recommendation to the full council. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think that's appropriate? If the finance committee would like to um, make a motion of a recommendation, we could do that. Otherwise we could um, bring that um, motion forward to the full council in the fall. As you see fit. Yeah, so I guess, uh, I guess I'm looking to- I would- <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Uh, I'd make a recommendation that we suggest to the full council to extend Scanlon for one year. Who was that? I'm sorry. Extend the contract that for a me. year. For one year? But that's Councillor Quinlan speaking, isn't it? Oh, yes, that's Councillor Correct. Yep, yeah, yeah. sorry. Is there a second to that motion? Okay, hearing none, would someone else like to make a motion? Hmm. Laura, are you humming <laughs> for? Trying to think. Um, I think it was the third one, right? No. I mean, I guess, you know, if the decision, if there's a consensus not to move forward with the full procurement process, the decision of whether to award a contract for one or three years can be made at a later time closer to the September 15th deadline. Good so, point. That's good. True. So um, usually you don't make a negative motion. Right. Or, right. <laughs> Um, so could we either just not make a recommendation at all, or would you recommend that someone make the recommendation that we um, vote against? Oh. I couldn't hear that. Or, or we could just announce that there appears to be consensus with the decision of not to proceed with a full procurement process this year and to make the decision in the fall of whether to award a contract for one or three years. There is no way I could have said that better myself. Yes. So that is our announcement. And so we will take this up in the fall. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being willing to have that discussion. Um, I see no other business on the finance agenda. I would move to adjourn finance. Second it. Motion's been made and second to adjourn finance. Um, roll call, please, Laura. Um, Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. <laughs> Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Oh, yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, we are adjourned. <laughs> finance, and we are back in our regular agenda Here's background noise there so if anyone knows that their background is noisy mute yourself please um finance so we're back to these financial orders um that we just discussed so first is point zero four one in order to authorize acceptance of easements from mass dot for damon road reconstruction move first, approval wait. please motion's been made Second. Second. It's been made by Councillor Droid, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Any further discussion on this? Hearing none, roll call, please. Okay. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor, oh, two more. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. That has been the rule. In first reading, uh, a motion has been made to suspend wow. rules by Councillor Labarge. Is there a second? Uh, point of order. Yes. 
was was I I don't think this was one of the items that the mayor was calling for uh, two readings. This is the DPW director has asked for two readings on this. Right. I'm sorry. Well, then I'll second. Then I'll second. Excellent. Been made and seconded. Um, any discussion on suspension of rules? Hearing none. Roll call, please. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Um, rules have been suspended. Move a second reading, please. This has been made. Move second reading by Councilor Blake, seconded by Councilor Labarge. Um, any discussion on second reading? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Yes. Uh, Councillor Jarrett. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. That passes in two readings. Next, we have 20 points for two. In order to authorize, uh, order to authorize the intermunicipal agreement for the towns for public health nursing program. Motion was made by Councillor Jarrett. Yeah. Second. Seconded by Councillor Mayori. Um, any discussion on this um, first reading? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Maori. Yes. That passes in first reading. Um, uh, was this one of the ones that Mayor Narkowitz asked for two readings on? Twenty forty four yes. is the oh oh I'm sorry. I know that. No, I'm Mayor, sorry. Mayor Narkowitz. Can you pop oh. on for a sec? I thought he wanted the MEMA one on two. I'm yes, here. Um, so the intermunicipal agreement, would you like yes. to on that? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, motion to suspend rules. My mute means she can't hear me. Second. No, we can hear you. Uh, <laughs> second. Motion yes. made and you know, I'm sorry, my confusion is the next one is 2043. Um the free cash to oh, NPS for Foster, right here. But are we're, we going, we're, are we doing 2044 or 2043? We're 2042. 2042. Oh my goodness! So uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. We were we're on the, okay. And, and uh, another point of information for the mayor. Yes. Uh, is it safe to say that you would like two readings on all these orders, the financial orders? Um, well, the the um, I don't have my agenda up in front of me. Um, I just have to switch over to that. Um, the the obviously the intermunicipal agreement is important, and right. the agreement with MEMA is important. Um, and you know, the, uh, obviously the the school money is a pass through that we're just we're just basically giving the school their money. So it's not, it's, and it's $4,000. So to the extent right. you want to clear the decks and do it, that's fine. But the ones that we were most interested in were the um, easements uh, for, with, um, with the Commonwealth and the, um, and then the two that are COVID-19 related, the, uh, the, the agreements with MEMA and with the um, other communities around the nursing program. Okay. Thank you very much. 42 and 44. So, um, uh, so I think we're still at the uh, suspension of rules. Is that right? That's correct. 
Any further discussion on suspension of rules? And I'm sorry, who who made the motion? Has there a motion been made? Council Mayor Council Mayori made the motion, and I seconded. Okay, thank you. Practicing. Good job. <laughs> um, okay, so Laura, when you're ready, roll call on suspension of rules. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Aye. Councillor Foster. Foster. Yes. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Move a uh, uh, second reading, please. Okay. Motion has been made. Second. Sorry. And been made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Mayori for second reading. Discussion on second reading. Hearing none, roll call, please. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. yes. Councillor Jarrett. Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, that passes in two readings. Up next is 20.043 in order to appropriate free cash to Northampton Public Schools for federal foster care transportation reimbursement. Move approval, please. Yeah. Motion's been made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Labarge, I believe. Any discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes, that passes in first reading. There's no need for a second reading. Um, next is 20.044 in order to authorize intermunicipal agreement with MEMA during COVID emergency. Approval. Move approval. Motion's been made by Councilor Labarge, seconded by Councilor Jarrett. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. <laughs> yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Suspend the rule. Motion's been uh, made. Second. Been, motion's been made to suspend rules by Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Dwight. Any discussion on suspension of rules? Hearing none, roll call on suspension of rules, please. Councillor Foster. Wait. Yes. 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 Councillor Jarrett. Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Uh, rules have been suspended. Motion to. Uh... Have a second reading, please. Second it. Motion has been made by Councillor Joyd, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Any discussion on second reading? Second reading. Hearing none except my own Hearing echo. My own echo. Um, roll call, please. Um, roll call, please. Um, Councillor Foster. 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 Yes. yes. Councillor Jarrett. Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay, that passes in two readings. Second reading. Uh, 20 point, uh, point one four. Okay. 
20.046, in order to approve gift fund expenditures for Resilience Hub. To approval, please. Motion is made by Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Dwight, um, with a side of Councillor Maori. Um, uh, any discussion on this order? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Maori? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? <laughs> yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. And Councillor Garrett? Yes. That passes in first reading. Moving on to financial orders. On second reading, we have 20.032 in order to establish water and sewer rates for FY 2021. Move approval, please. Second. Uh, it's motion's been made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? Hearing none. Laura, when you're ready, roll call, please. Sure. Councillor Maori? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Garrett? Yes. And Councillor DeBarge? Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. Next is 24035, in order to accept a donation of land on Woodland Drive for housing and trail uses. Move to approve. Second. Motion has been made by Councillor LaBarge, seconded by Councillor Dwight. Any discussion? Okay, roll call, please. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. And Councillor Maori? Yes. That passes in second reading. Next, we have 20.036. 036 in order to accept a donation of easement for electric power to Northampton State Hospital Memorial Park. Move to approve. Second. Second. So, motion's been made by Councilor LaBarge, seconded by Councilor Dwight. Um, any discussion? Okay. Uh, seeing none, roll call, please, Laura. Councilor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Maori? Yes. And Councillor Nash? Yes. That passes in second reading. Next, we have 20.038 in order to appropriate $3,000 in CPA funds to lay the communities for invasive species removal. Move to approve. Second. Motions uh, been made by Councilor DeBarge and seconded by Councilor Dwight. Uh, Councilor Jarrett has his hand up. His hand up. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, as uh, you all know, last a uh, couple of weeks ago, I abstained and have done more research uh, in the last in the last couple of weeks. And um, first, just to clarify that you know these CPC grants will use a combination of mechanical and chemical means to control and remove the invasive plants. And I find myself in the position uh, of not being a scientist or a public health professional, but trying to evaluate scientifically whether this use of pesticides is appropriate and safe. 
Um, my consultations with the former members of the Pest Pesticide Reduction Committee given me some great resources. And what that reveals is that the science is not conclusive. Um, I am a firm believer in the scientific method, but I also see how science is corrupted by the profit motive of large corporations. This happens because it is these corporations and the organizations connected to them who sponsor the studies that are determining the health risks uh, with the chemicals they are testing. And if a study comes back with results that they don't like, then they don't publish it. Or more insidiously, scientists recognize that if people who are paying their salaries don't like a result, they won't get further grants, which gives an incentive to, to set up a study in a way that will give results that are favorable to a certain result. Um, and there's a famous quote from Upton Sinclair, which is, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Um, so, and then my evaluation of what I could find out reveals that there is little risk to the public from the kind of pesticide application these grants will fund. The greatest risk may be to those who are applying the pesticides um, but there are many questions about the safety of even small quantities and its persistence in the environment. The pesticide itself may have been studied thoroughly and its risks well understood, but the additives or uh, ad adjuvants, adjuvants um, which help the pesticide stick around long enough to do its job have often not been studied uh, as, as thoroughly. Um, thinking about ecosystems, there, there is always change in ecosystems. Birds and other animals have transported new species and caused considerable change, you know, throughout history. Um, humans are just doing this so much faster. An alternative perspective on invasive species uh, is to consider that ecosystems will adapt to new species. And after their initial expansion, uh, other species will move in and a, and a balance will be found. Um, certainly some native species will decline. So there is another way to look at this other than the militaristic language of alien invaders and a, and a battle. And these alternate perspectives are worth considering. Um, so I, I believe in the democratic process we have established and I don't believe the work is complete the Select Committee uh, on Pesticide Reduction uh, last year recommends the committee's work be continued with another Select Committee established and uh, establishing a permanent Pesticide Reduction Oversight Committee. Um, so that's one side of this. And then um, another side is that the applicants who are putting this in have done tremendous work. Uh, hundreds of volunteers have put in countless hours in manually pulling plants, this work will continue. Uh, the applicant's goals are not to apply pesticides on an ongoing basis, but to use them to reach a goal after which manual methods will be used. Um, so I've weighed all these factors. I still feel conflicted, but I'm inclined to vote for these grants this time. Uh, if in a few of the years, these applicants come back with the same properties and ask for continuing work, I would feel much less likely to support it. Um, I hope that the science will advance, and I do strongly encourage the council to continue the work of the select committee so we can have a knowledgeable advisory board who can weigh in on specific use cases. Um, the Conservation Commission does uh, grant a permit, I believe, or does weigh in on this, um, so that's, that's important, and they, they have given that positive uh, recommendation or permit. Um, <clears throat> So um, that's, that's, that's kind of, that's where I'm at. And um, I was glad to do that research and, and feel much better about uh, voting on this at this time. Um, I do want to ask uh, the council president that, you know, once our current crisis has passed, if you will work with me um, to establish another select committee uh, as per the recommendations of the previous one. Um, which and that recommendation is basically to explore how to carry out the, the first committee's recommendations. So thank you. Um, thank you for those very thoughtful comments. Um, I I appreciate the question you just asked me directly, um, and I appreciate all questions. Councilor Jarrett actually had told me ahead of time that he was going to ask me this question, which really 
gave me time to think about it more deeply, um, which I appreciate having that time. Um, in thinking about it though, I've got to tell you, it, it became clear to me that this is a question that's outside the bounds of what can be discussed at this meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and it gave me an opportunity to think about it as a tool to highlight something that I think can really be confusing and maybe deserve some explanation. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, it is late. No one wants me to go school marm on you all. I'm really sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, uh, I, I just wanna take a, a couple moments to sort of explain it because I feel like in my years on the council, I've heard many times in discussion that something's not to the motion or there's been a point of order about something or the person presiding has, has asked if the comment is to the question. Um, and so for myself as president, I wanted to explore that a little bit more and wanted to be able to give you all a full explanation because uh, we're all learning. Certainly I am. Um, and I think, I think you all know that the sort of incremental building of knowledge that these positions we're holding um, demand is something that I take very seriously. And so, um, you know, from that perspective, one of the additional things that has made this moment in time uh, very hard and frustrating is that it's really upended what's still the beginning of a council term with um, a majority of new counselors. And for me, a new president has made the process of preparing and presiding over meetings challenging in, in, um, in new ways I couldn't even have begun to fathom six weeks ago. Um, so, you know, I feel like I had all these sort of hopes and dreams for how this first year for all of us would unfold and um, and that there would be a progression of knowledge and that those dreams are starting to feel sort of more remote, kind of like we are. Um, so I, I beg your pardon. I just want to take this opportunity to kind of pull that back for a moment and and um, and I thank Councillor Jarrett for the question and and I ask all of your indulgence in allowing me this digression on this quick digression, I swear, on open meeting law and Robert's rules to explain why we don't digress <laughs> from items on the agenda. I you know, it's a paradox. Um, so the motion on the floor is for a very specific and discreet order that's been listed on the agenda. The items on the agenda are um, to kind of use the parlance of open meeting law, what's reasonably anticipated will be discussed at the publicly posted meeting. Councilor Jarrett just made this point perfectly You know, in, um, during the finance committee. Um, and so those items that are on the agenda should be sufficiently specific to reasonably inform the public of the issues that will be discussed. Um, so though, and, and, you know, even though we're not required, we go even further than that. We make our best efforts to attach to our agenda, the actual documents, um, so that the public can see them. So, um, so when we say the deliberation should be limited to the agenda item, that's because otherwise the public has no way of knowing that something would be a topic of discussion. Um, and open meeting law is really about the public's access to deliberation. So, um, and then additionally, Robert's rules states that debate or deliberation applies to discussions on the merits of the pending question. Mm -hmm. um, this, is a, this is a quote on Robert's rules. So, um, discussion on the merits of the pending question, that is whether the proposal under consideration should or should not be agreed to. Um, and members' remarks should be germane to the question and must have a bearing on whether the immediately pending motion should be adopted. So uh, that's something that I'm striving to be better at keeping in mind when we start to wander in discussions. Um, as I'm learning this role and reflecting on our own culture and sort of spin on procedure, I um, I recognize that we tend to be looser in some ways and privilege a fuller, more robust um, discussion that sometimes is philosophical over sort of a strict parliamentary um, procedure, which is something that I appreciate. But in this instance, I think it really sort of um, intersects with open meeting law. So the, um, so again, I appreciate the question. I'm always happy to work with you. The establishment of a select committee in the future isn't on the current agenda for discussion and it would require its own motion and deliberation um, and is not a motion that's on the floor to approve the order to appropriate CPA small grants funds. So, um, so instead of just saying that, um, you know, the measure 
um, is, is not to the question. I really wanted to spend a little more time and explain that and just have us talk about that or have me talk about that as I'm just talking at you guys. Um, so, uh, so thank you. So, you know, this has been parenthetical and I, and, and I own completely paradoxic. Um, and again, one more P, I'm gonna beg your pardon, Councilor Jarrett for using your question for an explanation. Um, but I just wanted to explain as, a rep, as opposed to saying point of order, that question isn't, um, it is too. isn't germane to the topic. So, um, and in the future, I want us all to feel empowered to make a point of order, um, including and especially Laura, whose job is, a part of her job is to advise the council president on matters of parliamentary procedure. So I hope, um, I hope we will all feel empowered to do that. Um, and, um, but I also hope that we will retain sort of our own collegial culture that we have, which allows for full discussion. So again, Thank you. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you about this more, Councillor Jarrett. Uh, Councillor Jarrett. Oh, th yes. Thank you very much for that explanation. I, I think that makes perfect sense. Um, so I, I will withdraw the question and instead just simply say, I urge you to work with me in the future um, and all, anyone on the council as well. Um, <clears throat> so thank you. Thank Thank you, and thank you for thank your you previous for comments your previous um, and all the research and that you've done. Research. Councillor Mayori. Yeah, I just wanted to thank um, Councillor Jarrett for his really thoughtful uh, research on this and just to validate that, you know, I, I studied pesticide use and public health. It was my thesis, and I, it's still, I've still struggled with it. It's, it. You're correct that sometimes it's really not clear. And um, I will be supporting this because I, I feel like the people making those decisions look very hyper locally. I kind of trust their judgment on this from what I've talked to them about, uh, talked it over with them. Uh, but I, I, I get what you're saying. Um, yeah, it's, it's a real cost benefit analysis when you don't have all the information. So thank you for that. And I appreciate your digression. Uh, also share. Thank you. Um, okay, any other? discussion now that I've told you all you can't discuss things um okay seeing none roll call please Councillor Shara yes Councillor Thorpe yeah Councillor Dwight oh sorry I muted him <laughs> Councillor Dwight yes Councillor yes. Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. That passes in second reading. What is that? Um, Councillor Dwight, I'm sorry I keep muting you, but it sounds like you're doing woodwork or something. Something's going on. <laughs> Very loud. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm not doing anything. Somebody's making a tremendous amount of noise. Um, I won't disagree. Okay, uh, moving on to 20.039, in order to appropriate CBA funds for Beaverbrook Greenway Invasive Plant Control Project. Move approval. A motion's been made and seconded by Councillor Dwight and Councillor Labarge, I think. Yes. Any further discussion on this um, other CPA order? Okay. Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Thorpe. Councillor Dwight. Yes. No. Oh, thank you. I was muted. Oh, okay. I saw your mouth. Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Dwight, I'm sorry. Did you? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why Foster. not? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Jarrett. Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. 
Um, okay, that passes in second reading. We are moving on to ordinances in second reading. Um, and we're to 19.173, an ordinance to allow change from one conforming use to another without a finding. Move approval, please. Second. Motions were made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Is there any discussion on the second reading? Councillor Jarrett. Oh, you're still muted. Hold on. Oh, then I oh. muted you again. Sorry. <laughs> you're good. good. Okay. Um, I actually have a question for Councillor Quinlan. Um, I wondered if you'd be able to explain your no vote in the first reading further. Um, as we know, the, the zoning rules at present mean that, that no changes can be made in the use of non-conforming lots uh, unless there is a hardship. And does, does your no vote mean you want the rules to stay this way or is, is there another approach that you would favor? My, my no vote was based largely on um, a feeling that the, the idea around, I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm tired here, um, that, that we didn't need to uh, make the, that we needed to address some of the concerns of some of the residents that were opposed to the change uh, of this ordinance. Those residents in almost every case when they said they encouraged a no vote, were not saying vote no uh, and don't consider it. They were, they were asking for it to be considered a little more thoughtfully. Uh, so my thought was to engage with that community further, ask them more questions. Um, I'm still a no on this vote. I, I noted last time that that uh, Councillor Nash spoke eloquently and, and asked about the planning board putting more a more scrutinous eye on some of the uh, you know items that would come before them. But though that item is before us right now, um, and and I felt that that again we would be uh, the ones to kind of not necessarily pass it on to someone else, but to think about it ourselves. Uh, so again, my my vote was largely based on on trying to listen to those people that had asked us to consider this more more slowly. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay. Hearing, hearing none. Um, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yeah, yes. <clears throat> Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. No. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. Um, before our last motion, I just want to double check. We, we didn't skip anything, right? I just, we moved all around and I want to make sure you all would tell me if I skipped something, correct? Okay. Um, then um, we are ready for a motion. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Councilor Nash is very ready. Councilor LaVarge is ready. Motion has been made and seconded. Um, we need a roll call. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Jarrett. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. What is that? <laughs> Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Okay. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. We are adjourned. Thank you all so very much. You are super troopers. Um, thank you.